Officially an adult now, so I heard she got an ice cream cake from Dairy Queen. Ah, I was kind of expecting that too, and <laughs> <laughs> just didn't have it. So, where's the baby? All right, so tonight we're going to cover workforce safety and wellness. <coughs> As I like to refer to it, how not to kill yourself while on the job. So in order to take care of other people, we first need to be able to make sure that we don't become part of the problem. Okay, we have to take care of ourselves. Part of what we do when we train here is we teach you to recognize when things aren't right, okay, when they're not um, all hunky-dory. So we talked about some things as far as personal neglect. We have to take care of ourselves but even before the run okay, and be sure that we're ready to go. Um, I have to watch for different environmental and man-made threats. Um, some of them are simply the person themselves is the actual issue. Uh, sometimes it's simple things like weather or electricity, things like that. Then finally, afterwards, the mental and physical stress of doing the job. The suicide rate for emergency responders is 10 times that of the normal public. 10 times. Okay. There's something there. Okay, so we don't want to be the person that could have stopped someone from eating their gun. Right? Um, and we'll talk more about suicide later, which is like, yeah, you're a real happy subject, but anyway. So wellness is a state of complete mental, physical, and social well-being. That's what we want to see. Everybody we get around us, we're safe, we're well, they're well, everybody's well. Okay? A lot easier to say than it is to do. So not only do we have to be well when we're at work, we also have to be well when we're at home. Because no matter how good you are, eventually you're going to bring home with you to work, and you're going to bring work home with you at home. It's just the way it happens. So some components of wellness. We want to protect ourselves and those around us from disease and other hazards. Um, we'll be around, the whole point of this job is to be around sick people, right? So you're going to be around sick people. You have a chance of getting sick yourself. The stronger you are, uh, the stronger immune system you have, the less likely it's going to be that you end up having a disease yourself. Um, we'll talk some about proper nutrition. Our body is a, about a trillion chemical reactions all happening at once. If you don't put the right ingredients in, you're not going to get the right chemical reactions out. Sufficient exercise. The human body was made to move. So simple, our, our caveman ancestors on average walk about 12 miles a day. Which is amazing that they somehow figured that out. I don't know if they found a little bit, bit laying in a cave or something, I don't know, but um, somehow they figured out that it was 12 miles a day. Um, sufficient sleep, which is a chronic problem in our, our society. Our Western society, we're very fast-paced. We try to cram as much day into the day as we can. Uh, of course, we do that at the expense of sleep. Refraining from tobacco, drugs, and alcohol. Notice I said refraining from, not uh, completely running away from. We just want to make sure that it doesn't become a detriment to our lives. And then finally, taking time to relax. This was a really big issue for emergency responders, especially people that are volunteers. Um, for the guys that have pagers on, how often do you turn them off and just say, screw it, I'm not going anywhere right now? No. Eventually, you're going to have to. You can't do it forever. It's just that simple. I see it in your face. You're like, ah, whatever, man. That's all right. I'm telling you, eventually it's going to happen. Something's going to come up where you just can't go. So you have to disconnect every once in a while. So this job puts us in stressful situations. Um, and we'll talk about the different types of stressors, uh, but. Uh, the end of the day, it's a stressful job. It's a lot thrown on our plate. 
So we have to be prepared. And by that, we need to just simply understand that it's going to be stressful. We also then have to um, take care of ourselves while we're at home, before we come into our shift. Things like, um, don't come in on a hangover. If you're going to be working the next day, maybe you probably should go out drinking the night before. Um, anticipate your needed resources. The sooner you call the cavalry, the quicker they come. Not only on scene, but also then afterwards when you're dealing with the demons coming up to, that's catching up with you. Things that may have happened six months ago, but now all of a sudden you're having to deal with how you feel about them. Men especially are very bad about it, recognizing this. That, okay, hey, I'm, I'm drowning here. Um, there is no shame in that. Just simply meaning, hey, I need some help. Um, when we're on scene, we need to control the scene. Otherwise, it gets away from us. That can be incredibly difficult to do. Um, we'll go through a lot of training about you know, how to control scenes, how to handle that. And finally, care for your patient, which sometimes is not easy. It's very stressful. Sometimes they don't really want your help. Um, they can be very, very uh, hateful to you, even though you're just showing up there to help them out. Uh, they can be real jerks. So you have to kind of prepare for that. So you know, this bottom line, I, I love this, is your calm manner will calm everyone around you. My kind of way to put that is always calm, uh, calm and chaos are contagious. Whichever one you put out there is what you're going to get back. So stress, by definition, is any event, thought, or action perceived as a threat. Everything from Johnny left me, that 17-year-old girl, no offense, y'all. <laughs> all the way from that up to I'm being mauled by a bear. Okay, they're, they're all a stress. The body reacts the same way. We'll talk about the stress response. Um, so chronic emotional stress to the body is like being attacked by a bear every day. Okay, so it's, it's, um, it, it has long-term effects. So the big thing is, though, is no matter how hairy things get, um, we have to focus on, first and foremost, personal safety. Okay? You are no good to anyone if you're part of the problem. Um, after that becomes our scene safety, which you know, we talked last as far as our order of who we have to keep safe. First is always yourself. The next is your crew. After that, your patient. Then your bystanders, then your environment. Okay? You're going to want to get that order in there because I guarantee you, you'll see that on a, on a test. And then finally, once it's safe to do so, we're going to provide basic care and training. So how do we manage stress? How do we, how do we fix this? Um, we try to eliminate the stressors, or at least minimize them. If you have a partner that you just don't get along with, maybe try to find a different partner. Sometimes it may be a while until you can get that done. You just have to figure out a way to work it. Um, Sometimes it's pretty easy, just change shifts or something. Well, that is shifts. Okay, you work nights. You don't like working nights? Well, try to find a way to get days. Try to find a way to get the weekend. Maybe just take a few off. Um, change your work environment. Um, if it stresses you out that things are always dirty and disorganized, take some time and put them in the, in the right place. Um, I'll be honest with you, that's... That was one thing that always drove me nuts when I was volunteering. Was I'd get on the trucks and things were just trash. So I kind of became a little bit of an organization Nazi. Because it made me feel better when I was working to know that if item A was supposed to be in cabinet B, that that's where it was. Um, and finally, cut back on the overtime. Whether it's, you know, you're, you're working as a full-time gig. My first three years working full-time, I worked 5,000 hours each year. That was probably the dumbest thing I ever did. I was working the equivalent of two full-time jobs. Boy, was I making some awesome things. I was also driving myself into crime. So um, I can tell you from experience that's not worth it. Uh, from the volunteer side, every once in a while I'll stay home for Christmas. It's okay. okay. You don't all do it. You know, maybe just this once out of ten years or something. Take it. Hey, I'm going to enjoy Christmas. Even if it's just for a couple of hours or whatever it is that, that you enjoy. Um, 
you can try to change your attitude about the stressor. One thing that jumps out there with me is um, you'll come across other providers that aren't as enthusiastic about doing things correctly. They just kind of float through life. If things get screwed up, oh well. If they they miss a stroke, oh well. People that are very high performing people, that drives them crazy, right? I mean, does anybody know somebody like that where it's just, whatever, I don't care if it's screwed up. And it drives you nuts, right? Eventually you have to realize, okay, there's, there's really nothing I'm gonna do about it other than I can control what I can do. I can't control what that person does. So you have to kind of learn to let things go. That is not easy. Uh, you can try talking about your feelings. This is huge um, for certain people. Uh, certain people, absolutely, I mean, talking about their feelings is the emotional equivalent of castration with a dull spoon. <laughs> it's just incredibly painful. Um, I always tell people, find a way to get it out. Whatever your way is. My wife knows if she comes home and I'm shoving trees around with my tractor for no apparent reason, if he's had a bad day, just let him shove some trees away. That's my way of getting it out. I rearrange the rural environment. Um, <laughs> so, if for some, you know, if, if talking what it works for you, by all means, do it. Um, I had one friend of mine that he would come home and he would talk to his yeah. dog. And he would have very in-depth conversations, albeit one way, with his dog. He was just simply getting it out. Um, if you do realize, oh, I think I'm drowning here, this, this is getting bad. Seek, seek counseling early, okay? Um, there is really no shame in that. I can tell you flat out, I've been to a counselor numerous occasions. Okay? Sometimes these things pop up and it's, you can't shake them. You gotta you know, call in a pros, man. If your house is plumbing was bad, you wouldn't think twice about calling a pros in, right? Why would, why would we think twice about our mental health? So, if you need it, go get it. Um, and then just kind of try to take a big picture look at it. You'll be a little bit more relaxed. Try to expand your social support system. What we mean by that is your group of friends. Okay, your, your family, friends, peers, whatever. Try to branch outside of emergency response. I have a friend that doesn't ride an ambulance. Um, so that way you can talk about something other than dead babies. Okay. Um, try to minimize your physical response to stress. Build your body. Um, deep stretching, meditation, yoga, all that kind of stuff. Um, it, it works. It's just that simple. It works. A lot of times a few slow deep breaths will be enough to defuse it so you don't want to punch anybody. Um, try to limit your intake of caffeine, alcohol, and tobacco. That kind of goes like that. So, nutrition. Again, the body is what you feed it. So, eat nutritious food. No matter what system status managers or dispatchers feel, we can't run off nothing but carbohydrates and candy bars. It doesn't work that way. And we do occasionally need to stop and eat. Uh, so, try to keep food with you. Uh, even when I was volunteering, I had a little go bag in the back of my truck that had just you know, a few candy, you know, uh, like granola bars and stuff in it. It also had a bunch of other things in it, like bug spray and sunblock and all that kind of stuff. You never knew what you would need. Um, but kind of have that stuff with you. Try to make time to exercise, even if it's just 15 minutes a day, 10 minutes a day. Better than nothing. Then your sleep. Try to get it set where it's regular and uninterrupted. Wow, that's a challenge, right? Because you know what's going to happen as soon as your head hits a pillow, you get that good, uh, you're drooling, dreaming about Heidi Klum kind of sleep. Painter goes off. Get right back, get right back up. You know more than getting done with that, you lay down, Heidi's back in your room, and bam, it happens again. Everyone's, what's that? That's when you get the painter off. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Come here, Heidi. I'll be <laughs> the thing of it is, if, you know, I've had a run where I, I took the run of my underwear. 
because we had had grass fire after grass fire after grass fire all day. I'd been it was going to paramedic school, so I had these awful things called zombie weekends, where it was Thursday morning, all the way, I'm sorry, Friday morning all the way to Sunday night, I was up the whole time. And I would just bounce from clinical to clinical until it was time to go back to my third shift job. So late Sunday afternoon, I was in, sleeping, feeling good. Baby goes off. I get up, get going, and get in the truck and realize I don't have pants on. Am I any good to anybody if I can't remember to put my pants on? Yeah, you're no good to anybody. Take it. Take it some time. Get some sleep. That's why fire departments and EMS departments have more than one person on them. Everybody will take their, their, their shift and it'll go by without any problem. Disease prevention. Know your and your family's health history. Okay? Um, and then adjust your lifestyle to match that. If every man in your family has died of heart disease before the age of 45, you probably should not have two thirds of your meals come from KFC. It's not going to end well for you. See your doctor. Make sure you're getting on the any medications you may need. Um, I love this cartoon because of it. I've seen it time and time again. The provider's chastising somebody about if they would just take care of themselves. Best friend I ever was a guy over in DeKalbe. Um, we had this lady that she was a real bad breather. She would try it to fix it herself, try to fix it herself, because she just was almost about ready to stop breathing. Then she, her family would finally break down and call us. Good news is, is she turned around pretty quickly. You gave her proper treatment, she bounced back pretty easy. We'd get in there and he started going off, but you know, if you would just take care of yourself, blah, blah, blah. I couldn't help it. I said, says the 300 pound diabetic. Really? I mean, are you, are you the pot or the kettle? Okay, so if we want to tell our patients to take care of themselves, we should probably be doing that ourselves. We really should kind of be a flagship for the healthcare system. Okay? This is what healthy people are supposed to look like. So there's a few different types of disease we'll talk about. We'll go into a whole lot more when we get later in the course. But for now, we're just going to talk about the broad, broad categories. Um, the first is infectious disease. That's a disease that is caused by an or, a microorganism within the body. Some of those, not all of them, are what we call communicable. Those diseases can be spread from person to person or from one species to the next. Uh, simple things like the cold. You know, the common cold or the influenza, hepatitis, things can bounce from person to person. Um, how do we reduce our risk? Um, first and foremost, get immunizations. Um, I always tell people as far as getting vaccinated, get educated, then go get vaccinated. Okay, know what works, know what works for you. Um, don't don't only go to one website, okay? Jenny McCarthy may not be the best expert source on vaccination information. Um, you know, go to different sources and make sure you get educated. Um, protective techniques, wear your equipment. This is simple, and the equipment does you no good if it's sitting in the back. It actually has to be on you. And then hand washing. I'm gonna let you guys, I'm gonna give you the answer to a state test question right now. The single best way to stop the spread of disease is hand washing. I'll repeat that. The single best way, I guarantee you, will be on a state test. Um, because it's just that simple. If you guys sit back and think about it, um, why do you think there's bottles of lotions sitting around ERs all the time? Because these people wash their hands so often that they end up getting dry, cracked hands, so they have to wash up, you know, use some lotion. Because it works. This from spreading disease from one room to the next, or one patient to the next. Um, so wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. How long does it take to wash your hands properly? 20 seconds. Okay. Usually between 15 and 20 seconds. Easy way to remember is just sing happy birthday to yourself twice. Sing it to yourself, because otherwise people will think you're nuts. So, one of the things we'll talk about is a pathogen. 
A pathogen is a microorganism capable of causing disease. Um, they break down into some different categories, things like bacteria, uh, which is a full cell mic uh, uh, microorganism, uh, viruses, which are actually just small strains of DNA, uh, and they require a host in order to be able to survive. Bacteria, uh, bacteria, rewind. <laughs> Bacteria, viruses, and fungi, uh, protozoa, things like that. There's a bunch of different categories. Uh, the next term we'll talk about is contamination. Contamination and exposure are actually two different things. An exposure is just simply you've been placed in an area where you could have been in contact with this. So, let's say I have tuberculosis, and I forgot to tell you guys. Simply by being in the same room with me, you've been exposed. That does not mean that you have been contaminated with anything. Contamination is when you are actually in physical contact with it, and then you're in it, okay, for lack of a better term. So, some routes of transmission. These ones you're going to want to know cold, okay. Um, direct contact. That is, I come up, <laughs> snap on my hand, and then wipe it on you. Thanks, buddy, right? That's direct. I, I just one thing touches the next. The next would be indirect contact. So there's um, a step between it getting from me to, to somebody. So um, dirty needle sticks is probably about the easiest way to think of this. Okay, so if I um, poke somebody with an IV needle and then try to recap it myself and end up uh, poking my own finger, that'd be an indirect contact. Um, the next one I'll talk about is an airborne transmission, and it's just that. It goes into the air. Sneezing, coughing, um, spraying from things, you know, as far as from, from airway maneuvers and things. Um, it goes into the air in little droplets. Uh, foodborne transmission, you eat it. Uh, things like salmonella, probably the classic one there. If you eat a pork chop that's only been cooked for 10 seconds per side, you're probably going to get sick. Um, and the lastly is vector borne, which is there's another organism that carries it. Uh, things like malaria, uh, West Nile virus, uh, the plague are all carried by another organism. So malaria is a mosquito, plague is a rat, uh, things like that. So we have to train you in handling bloodborne pathogens because you're going to be exposed to blood. People that have their arms ripped off, magically they have blood everywhere. So we get exposed to that. So I'm going to email you guys a link to a couple videos that I'm not going to lie to you. God, they're boring. But we got to push it through. Okay? Watch the video and we'll just move on. Okay? So big thing to remember with bloodborne pathogens is the idea of standard or universal precaution. What that boils down to is that we assume that every liquid or every fluid or substance that we come across is potentially infectious. So we just assume that it's infectious and take steps to protect ourselves from it. It boils down to if it's wet, sticky, and not yours, don't touch it without gloves on. Because you have no idea what's in it. So pretty much every patient you're going to have gloves on. You have every patient that's going to be, you know, coughing and sneezing. You probably don't want to have gloves and a mask. You just assume that whatever they're putting out there is infectious. Um, along with that is good hand hygiene, because maybe we pick up somebody's pen, we have no idea what's on it. So we're going to wash our hands afterwards, make sure that we don't spread it. Um, personal protective equipment or PPE for you guys that have been in the, you know, the. Emergency response business for a while, you've heard that term before, people you know, may not have heard that. It's all of the stuff that your employer will give you to keep the outside world from touching you. Okay. Um, long story short, if, if your gown's packed up in the cabinet in the truck, is it doing you any good? No, right? it, doesn't matter. it doesn't matter how good PPE they bought for you, if you don't wear it, it's not going to do you any good. Thing is, you have to actually wear it. Is it uncomfortable? Yes. Does it look stupid? Yes. For some reason, they choose that god awful yellow color for gowns. It is not a manly color. I'm not gonna lie to you. 
Okay. Um, anybody ever been in a hazmat suit, like a Class A hazmat suit? Yeah. How comfortable are those? <laughs> no. Okay. Um, when I'm on shift, I wear a Kevlar vest. It's comforting, not comfortable. Okay. It's hot, it's heavy, it's miserable. But I know if somebody gets off a lucky shot, I'm gonna have a big bruise, but I'm gonna go home again in my shift. So it does you no good if it's not on you. Okay. So we also have to think not only about ourselves, but also the environment that we're in. So um, we touch a lot of things caring for people. Um, I did this once in another class, and I ran out of powder. Otherwise, I was going to do it tonight. Um, you put phosphorescent powder on, powder on a pen, and then you just see how far it travels. I guarantee it. I if I put a pen in here and said, hey, okay, I need you to sign in again, which we actually have to do that tonight. Remind me of break. It's not going to be out. Um, before you know it, all of you would have that powder on your hands. Before you know it, now it's all over your books, all over your computers, it's on the bathroom door knob. All of a sudden, Char and Lauren are having it on their hands. <coughs> I've got it on all places of me. It spreads very, very quickly. Simply because we don't think about the things that we touch. In the EMS environment, we have to think about that. We have to clean these things as we use them. Okay. So if the cot has gotten pooped on by the patient that you're carrying on now, would you want to be the next person? I don't want anybody else to poop. So clean your cot. Okay, just that's it. Um, environmental controls. Those are things we can put in place that keep diseases from spreading. Things like negative pressure rooms. Every, every ER is required to have at least one negative pressure room. What they mean by that is it can only draw air into the room. It can't let anything out. The reason we do that is if we have someone who's got an airborne disease or something like that, we don't want that being pressurized out into the rest of the ER. We want it all kept into one room. Um, your textiles and your laundry, Linens are like little sponges for gross stuff. Okay, so change them out, keep them clean. If they've been on your unit for the last, you know, 14 years, they probably need change. Right? Um, you guys think about, I mean, the wool blanket you guys use for extrication. I mean, I'm sure, I mean, pretty much all of you have a unit that has a wool blanket on it. When was the last time that was washed? What's that? After last education. When, was, when was the last time it was washed after that? Before that? That is the exception, not the rule. Yeah. Um, I've seen some hospital sheets in the back of the that get tucked back in the corner. They're black because they've been in there so long. Um, I wouldn't want to have that on me. So needles and other sharp objects. You guys really aren't going to be doing any needle work, per se. But most likely, you're going to be around some sort of provider that does. So you may end up having a needle in your hand at some point. Don't poke yourself with it. <laughs> you believe I have to say that? Yeah, don't poke yourself with it. There's a few different things we can talk about as far as how to make sure that you minimize your uh, risk of poking yourself with, with a shark. Um, you know, some special circumstances you got to think about is patient resuscitation, cardiac arrest. There is stuff flying everywhere, right? Um, how many of you have been on a cardiac arrest? Every once in a while, there's people flying around, right? There's a lot of things happening all at once, which means there's a lot of dirty, contaminated things flying around. Okay, so we have to be on kind of alert for that. Um, then also, like respiratory hygiene, or what we call cough etiquette. Um, who is who is taught to cough into their hands? Think about it. I cough into my hands. What do I do next? Really? <laughs> really? Who's supposed to? Yeah, you're supposed to. But what's the next thing you do? You go touch stuff. Yeah, go grab your sandwich, grab the doorknob, whatever. You know, you're spreading it all around. Um, so it's much better to actually cough into your elbow because you don't touch things to your elbow. And then go wash your elbow. Um, you will have a lot of patients that they have about Zero cough etiquette. 
You'd be like, how are you, man? <laughs> I'm fine. Like, right in your face. I'll be honest with you, a lot of the times when I'm talking to people, and if I hear a cough as I'm coming in, I'm going to assess them from back here. Yeah, you put all that nasty crap over there until I figure out what you got. You know? All of that stuff in my face. So, again, I know it's not like a broken record. Hand washing is the simplest, yet most effective way to control disease transmission. Can't stress that one enough. So, it says wash your hands before and after patient contact. That is great. Just one problem with that. How many of you guys have a sink in your truck? Um, I, I actually did reach to work with a person who would use like the alcohol cleaner on his way to a run. Um, you're going to think about it? Yeah, probably the best idea. Um, just, you have to do it. So that leads into the next thing is if there is no running water, use a waterless hand washing substitute, whether it be the, the foam, the gels, whatever you happen to have on your unit. Here we go. So gloves. Wear gloves as there is any possibility for exposure to anything. Again, that's universal or standard precaution. If it's wet and sticky, I'm wearing gloves before I touch it. There are different types of gloves. Um, the big one that you'll see in uh, EMS today is nitrile. You may still see some vinyl gloves. Very rarely would you see any latex gloves outside of a surgical suite because of allergies. Um, instead of having to ask every single person, it's easier to just get rid of them. The problem is latex gloves are very good for dexterity, so surgeons really love them, you will still see them in surgery. So taking gloves off and on does kind of require a little bit of special technique, um, because you don't want to fling or, or stick stuff all over yourselves in the process of getting gloves off and on. That would suck, right? So that being said, let's take a five minute break. Then we're going to come back and we're going to do a little activity about putting gloves on and off, okay? So is there anyone here that knows that they're an extra large glove? Okay, can you get into a large mm -hmm. or is it? You can't? Okay. So you, can you squeeze yourself into a large? Okay. So let me go grab some gloves, take a five minute break, relax a little bit, you've been throwing it on me already. So, uh, Yes, that's the next thing I'm going to do. All right, during the break at some point, if you would go ahead and grab a pair of gloves. Um, actually, grab two sets. Whatever size that you think you're most likely going to be. I need to get one on, it's way too small to reach the at least then you know what size. Someone told me they were ordering it. 
The sun and she's over there and it's making its way around. It's get started again so some things about putting gloves on and taking them back off it seems like such a thing that you should just be able to do right um, it's not the case <laughs> uh, first and foremost if your hands are wet you're screwed okay <laughs> you're not gonna get a wet hand in like these guys with gloves so you're gonna have to get your hands dried somehow um, whether it be your shirt or whatever but you got to get them dried somehow um, if you're having to change gloves, a lot of times it's good to take a rag or something to try to get that sweat off your hands. Otherwise, you're going to fight them. Okay? Um, some of the other things we see that trip people up is before you go to put them on, look and see which side the thumb is pointing towards. We all giggle, but there's a lot of people that are walking around, ah, oh, and they rip them off and they're mad. That kind of thing. Um, so just take a quick second and look and see which side the glove the, the thumb is on. Um, if you can get them opened up and get a little bit of air in there, that'll help you out a lot. Take your hand and cup it. So basically what you're doing then is you're creating a little air bubble here, right? So come in, and then you just start working your hand into it, and it'll flop right in. Easy breezy, right? If you guys get a chance, wet your hands down and then try to do that. That's not so easy. So... As far as when you're putting them on, and again, I'm going to, you know, kind of delve a little bit into working, you know, a, a responding unit as opposed to um, if you guys find yourself in a factory response team or something where you're not really responding to anything, it just happens where you are. Um, so those, that's kind of just put them on as soon as you can. But if you're responding, you want to put a little bit of thought into how many things am I going to touch with these before I actually touch patients. These gloves are very, very thin for a reason. We want to be able to feel through them, right? The problem is what that does is it makes them very fragile. Okay? So if you put them on way super early, one, your hands are going to sweat crazy. 
So then your fingers start moving around. And if you put them on too early, then you're touching a lot of stuff that may be contaminated. So you're spreading things around. Um, you're also taking a chance of tearing them and opening the door, um, grabbing equipment, something like that. And then you have to start over, but now you have to start over with sweaty hands. So uh, keep that in mind as you're considering when to put them on. Usually what I do is when I'm coming in, it's, um, I'll have them in my hand until I can see the scene. As soon as I get it, you know, it's like, okay, there it is, then I put my gloves on real quick. Because it doesn't take very long. Um, if I'm driving, of course, that's not the case. I wait until I'm actually at scene stop. So, any questions on putting them on? Pretty straightforward. Just avoid your hand being on. Taking them off is a bit more critical. Okay, so you think you have to think a little bit more. Because now you know you've touched something gross, right? So, you don't want to to take that contaminant and put it on you. Or worse yet, in you. Okay, as far as your eyes, your face, that kind of thing. So, when you take gloves off, you want them to be at your waist or lower. Okay? Very rarely are you going to get anything inside you here, right? Up here, though, because you see a lot of people that do this number, all you're doing is flapping this nice little cloud of gross stuff right in front of your face. I cringe every time I see somebody big gloves up like that. Or the big snapping deals. Now you're, that cloud's going over you and everyone else around you. You know, what a Christmas gift that is, right? Here, here's some hepatitis. You know, yeah. Uh, so don't be that guy, right? So to properly take them off, down around your waist, grab the outside of the glove, you're just basically going to pinch, pull it out, start bringing your hand out until it's just your four fingers. Now, everything with skin is still clean, right? Everything out here is still clean, because that's the inside of the glove. So, well, I should say it's as clean as I am. Take your other hand and ball that up, and you're just going to kind of keep pulling at it until that's out and away. Now, this hand is still clean, right? All the nasty stuff is inside this one. Take your two fingers, come underneath. Now, you're underneath, we're on the inside where it's still clean. Pull your hand through. Now you just turn the glove inside out with the other one inside it. Everybody end up with like that? Everybody end up with minus a thumb or anything? See? Nice and easy. Any questions? No? So, what we'll do throughout the course will be times where we'll kind of have you practice doing that stuff. A lot of your skills will have you put gloves on. Just to get used to the idea of putting on, taking them off. I've been known to even kind of purposely tear your glove, so that way you have to change out in the middle and get used to the idea of having to deal with a wet hand because it sucks. <laughs> it sucks. So um, that's that. So eye protection, face shields, that face and eye. If you wanted to find a place to put a disease into a human, from the neck up is about the holy grail, right? There's all kinds of ways into, into uh, their inner circulation. So if you have someone that's going to be splattering or uh, spraying anything, coughing, sneezing, gagging, you're doing an airway maneuvers, anything that puts things out in the air, you need to start thinking eye face protection. Okay, Keep that stuff out of you. A lot of people think that, well, I wear prescription glasses, I'm good to go. Not at all. Okay? Remember these things, they come up in the like, aerosol clouds a lot of times. So wind currents can push them. As you move your head, you create little wind currents. That will actually suck them around your glasses. So um, prescription glasses really aren't, aren't going to cut it. So goggles and face shields are by far the best. Do they look stupid? Absolutely. Do they fog up all the time? Absolutely. But it's better than getting pink eye, right? Anybody ever had pink eye? Yeah, that's a tree, isn't it? So... As we keep ratcheting up the grossometer here, right? Now let's start thinking about gowns. This is where we have patients that are going to be splattering things. Think um, spurting arterial bleeds, childbirth, explosive diarrhea. Yes, it does get that bad. Yes, uh, where you're considering a full gown. 
Basically, the way I always kind of put it is, if you have the slightest inkling of, wow, I should probably be in a gown, you should have long since already been in a gown. Okay. Um, these situations, it's, there's just stuff flying everywhere. Now, that being said, they're not always practical for a lot of situations. Um, and occasionally may even pose a risk for injury. Big thing with that is like if you're around any spinning machinery, um, if you're going to be going underneath the wash of a helicopter, things like that, you want to have that gown off before you do those things because things that flap out and around can get caught in things and all that. So that's kind of the exception to the rule. So different types of masks are out there. Um, your standard surgical mask is really just there to keep you from tasting whatever it is. Okay. It's pretty minimal protection, really, from the pathogen itself. It's really just there to keep it off of you. Um, so are they helpful? Absolutely. Are they best practices? Not really. Um, the mask that you'll see for people that is really kind of the, the, the meat taters of, of mask protection for us, what's called an N95 mask. The difference between it and a surgical mask is that the weave is much tighter. So it catches things that are much smaller. Um, but there are pathogens that can make it through an N95 mask. Not very many of them, but it is possible. Um, so that's where having a good healthy immune system and the environmental controls and things like that come in. Occasionally you'll see people putting on uh, either an air purifying device or actually putting on a CBA or you know, like the actual air pack. So, has everyone in here at least seen an SCBA? No? You've never seen one? Okay, well, we'll try to get one in class so you can see it. Okay. Um, because it's one of those things you, you, you should be, have, be able to have one on once you kind of appreciate how they work. Okay. You may end up finding yourself in one. So, we'll see. We'll, we'll get that done for you. Um, that's a pretty rare event that you're going to be having SCBA on, on a medical call, but it does occasionally happen. Um, I have worked one cardiac arrest in this. Oh my god, this house is gross. <laughs> um, people were vomiting as they walked out of the house. Yeah, it was, I, we had to kick dead animals off the guy. It, it, yeah. um, <laughs> were we maybe going a little overboard with it? Probably, but I, it was just simply a smell. I mean, we, you, you couldn't overcome the smell. Um, big thing with this is if you are. Are you at least suspecting tuberculosis? At a minimum, it needs to be an N95 mask. Okay. So patients with an active cough, which is really going to be your biggest sign, okay, this may be a TB patient, equals an N95 mask. Okay. So occasionally you have to do rescue breathing, uh, especially mouth to mouth. We don't do mouth to mouth very much in professional EMS. Um, I've only had to do it a couple times. I've regretted it each time. Because people puke. You think your taste, your puke tastes bad? Wait till you taste somebody else's. Yeah, yummy, right? So um, I always urge people these masks. You can buy those for about six bucks. You can buy the little sheet style ones, where it's just like a little sheet of plastic. You can buy those for about two or three bucks. They fit on a keychain. Why on earth would you not have those with you? Um, I actually carry a, a background mask in my truck just for if I happen to long something. Um, so have that stuff with you. That way you don't have to you know, be even tempted to do true mouth to mouth. Um, so this is a barrier that doesn't allow even you know, viruses through. Okay? It's very, very tight. So once they're used, they're no good. Just get rid of them. Okay? Um, so don't try to clean them and reuse them. They're no good. Um, the different types are a pocket mask, which is what you're seeing right here. A uh, bag valve mask, and we'll go into this a lot more when we get into airway and ventilation. Um, it's just, it's the big bag that kind of sits off like this. You've probably seen it on TV. Uh, that's what we're talking about there. So when we talk about sharks, um, anything that has these remotest possibility of cutting you should be treated like a shark. Okay? So um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a needle. Um, there's occasions where we pull out a scalpel. That's a shark. Pieces of glass that fall out of somebody and removing them. That's a shark. Potentially infectious. 
So anything with the capability of cutting, watch out for those. Needles, though, are the ones we really kind of come into more often. Um, and the key with that is we don't want to recap a needle. What we mean by that is they come with a cap over them. Once we take that off to use it, we don't want to grab it in this hand, put it in this hand, and try to put the cap back on. Because the problem is somebody could bump us. You know, if we're moving in the back of the truck, and, you know, hit a bump and move it, and all of a sudden you poke your finger. Your skin is only about a third of a millimeter thick. So it doesn't take much of a poke before it's actually into you. Okay, so even just little scratches actually can uh, transmit a disease. So um, there is a way to recap a needle. Basically, just lay the cap down and then lay it on this. So that way your second hand is never in the way there. Um, you guys really should very, very rarely find yourself recapping it. Most of what you're going to be doing is putting it into a sharps container. So like this you're seeing in here, grab it by the nice unsharp end. Keep this away from everybody. Keep it pointed down, especially if you have to walk somewhere with it. So if you did trip and fall, it goes, you know, points away from you. So it doesn't fall in and stab you. Um, and then make the trip as absolutely short as possible. So it's not like here, take this needle and go sharp it. And on your way, go do this and this. If, no, I'm going to go sharp this, then I'll go do those other two things. Okay. Keep that trip as short as possible. Uh, any sharp needs to go into a puncture-proof container. Uh, on our trucks, they're always on the, the back side by the door. There's also one in the, the bag itself. You guys, is, any of you guys' units carry a sharp container? Some do, some don't. How do you guys do? Um, you guys can always kind of piggyback onto ours because you're not really going to be care, doing any puncture work before we get there. So, um, but you know, some VLS units do end up carrying them. Uh, keep in mind that you may not have necessarily brought the needle to the show. Patients have a lot of needles at home. So they still need to be treated as infectious sharks, even if they're laying on their kitchen table. So your employer, whether that be a paid employer or the, you know, the, the department head of your volunteers organization, um, does have some responsibilities to you as an employee. Because that is, you know, as far as how OSHA sees it, you are an employee. <coughs> so the thing is, we understand that there's no guarantee of 100% risk-free environment. That's never going to happen. But what the employer has to do is take reasonable steps to minimize your risk of communicable, communicable disease. Okay. Has to supply you with uh, personal protective equipment. Has to, you know, if you're handling sharks, has to give you the boxes, that kind of thing. It also has to train you to make sure that you stay trained. One of the other big things that your department has to do is have, the, have an infection control plan. So what are we going to do, one, to, to not get infected in the first place? That's the real hope. And the other is, what do we do with someone who does accidentally get exposed or contaminated with something? So all of your departments will have one. It's probably way in the back of a uh, file cabinet somewhere, but it is there. Uh, so it would behoove you to ask, okay, hey, you know, what, what, what is our plan if I uh, am exposed to something? Do you need to know the entire plan? Probably not. Do you need to know the first step? Yeah. Usually that first step is to contact a supervisor or a chief or something like that. But at least you know for your specific department, find out what that first step is. Um, so some things we can do to help with that is establish a, a control routine. So it should be part of your daily routine. Every time you get to the truck or get to your unit or whatever, cleaning should be a part of that. Keep this place clean. Don't trust the shift before you. You know, be like, oh, you know, Paul worked this last last run. He's usually pretty good about keeping things clean. I'm just, we're gonna roll with it. I'm tired this morning. Paul, you ever slept on? Absolutely, yeah. Everybody has. So, he may not have even been in, intentional. He may have just not realized that that explosive diarrhea patient had run underneath the floor into the corners, where you have to reach to grab a quarter that you dropped. And now you've got a quarter covered in shack, okay? Yay, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't need 20 minutes that bad. So clean your, you clean your unit, each run, um, and then on a daily basis, even before you have a run. 
just because you don't know what happened on the shift before you. Uh, when you get to the hospital, try to clean up so that you're ready for the next one. Um, if that's what you, you know, if that's part of your scope as far as uh, actually doing transports. So good news is, even if a germ does, you actually get into your system, it's not a guarantee you're going to be sick. <clears throat> Because we do have this wonderful thing called immunity. No one has perfect immunity. Okay? So everyone can get sick with something. But there are ways that we can boost our immunity. Probably the first one is just simply be healthy. Um, one of the nice parts about working full-time EMS anyway, is for about the first six months, it's the sickest you'll ever be. It's just one disease after another, after another, after another. Because you're constantly around sick people. After that, though, your immune system can fight off pretty much everything. And it's actually pretty rare for you to get sick. So um, it's one of the nice parts. We don't, you know, most of our sick days, we're just, we got anal glaucoma. I just can't see my ass being here today. But um, the actual disease, you know, we build a strong immunity. If we keep ourselves healthy, healthy. if we do nothing but smoke, eat like crap, don't exercise, and you know, let diseases run wild, well then of course, we're gonna be weaker when we do get exposed to something. Now the next big thing you can do is to receive immunization. Uh, some immunizations are gonna be required by your employer. Things like hepatitis, measles, mumps, rubella. Um, some are very strongly encouraged, like influenza, stuff like that. Some are completely voluntary. If you work hard enough, you could probably get a smallpox vaccination. You really want to. Um, why? I'm not sure, but you know, unless you're going to you know some third world country or something. Um, but I mean, if you need it, you know, get it, and then keep them up to date. Immunizations are not a one-time deal. You have to get boosters every so often. So, okay, let's. It all went wrong, right? We got exposed to somebody's icky, sticky stuff. What do we do? If you're, you're exposed to the point where you're concerned that you're not able to continue for continue patient care, um, turn that patient care over to another provider if you can. That's not always going to be an option. If you're the only one there, you're the only one there. Um, clean your the exposed area. Whatever it got into you, try to get it cleaned out. If it is your eyes, this is another one. That's, Guarantee it's going to be on a state test somewhere. Um, it's how long you rinse eyes for. It's at a minimum of 20 minutes with copious amounts of water. What, do we, what does the word copious mean in this context? As much damn water as you can get into your eye. It's the, basically, the, the, there is no limit. Just wash, flush, as much as you can get in there. You guys ever seen those fountains that they have a lot in factories and things like that? Next to the first aid station? Um, you ever stuck your eyes in one of those? It's a weird feeling, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's like somebody's pushing on your eyes. Um, fight through it. Even if you have to like physically hold your eyes open. Uh, a lot of times where you'll actually have someone else holding your eyes open because you're going to want to close them because your eyes are irritated. Um, you want to activate your department's infection control plan. Um, so whatever that first step is, make it happen. Uh, and afterward, this is the part that normally gets forgotten, especially on the volunteer side, is to complete an exposure report. Here's the kicker. Even when you're volunteering, you're still covered under workers' comp. So if you were to get sick and have to miss work, there are ways for you to be, you know, get some benefits from that workers' comp insurance if you filled out the report. Most policies you have anywhere from 24 to 48 hours to get that report filed, or they consider it that this never actually happened. When we go into documentation, we'll talk about if it's not written down it didn't happen. That's very much the case with exposure reports. All right, so we're going to change gears a little bit. Now we're going to talk about team safety, as far as you know, making sure it's even safe for us to be here. When does your scene size up start? Take a guess. When you get 
all fine answers. I'm going to go one step further. As soon as you realize there's a possibility, you're responding to something. So basically, when I go on duty, you're probably thinking, what? What are you talking about? If there's six inches of snow on the ground, does that change how I do a scene survey? Absolutely. I know that when I'm going in, that the weather's different. You work mines. If you know there's a, um, a convention of bikers in town, that changes the way that you look at it. So um, try to think about that as the moment that you know that you will be responding to something. You may not even know what it is yet, but you have the possibility of responding to something. That's really when that's, that scene size up starts. Um, so you want to be thinking about all that stuff from the very beginning. And once you get on scene, you also want to make sure that you keep looking for all of these things. Because scenes are dynamic, they can change. So just look at this picture. What types of things do we have to worry about just in this little segment of a scene? Just spitballs. Okay, traffic. Absolutely traffic. Other people. Okay, other people. As far as like a crowd, possibly, or the other provider. Yeah, provider you don't know what's going on there. Yeah. Keep thinking. Or if it's on the ground, I can catch fire. Okay, but anything on food on the ground? If it's wet on the ground, can you also slip and fall? It's nighttime. It's night. Visibility. What else? The weather is really cold. We really can't see that there. Is it really cold? Is it really hot? What else? Fire. Okay. We technically we did just light a fire, right? Absolutely. All right. Good. So one of the special things we'll talk about as far as scene size up, and we have a whole chapter related to scene size up. We're just breezing through it right now. Uh, is hazardous materials. Not the level bad stuff. Is there any hazmat materials in here? Anybody know what I'm talking about when I say that? The people that hazmat is for life, man. I dig it. Like any hazmat tax or anything like that? Um, those folks are intense. Yeah, our chief was a thumb roll. Absolutely. Yep. If I, can, if, I can, if I can't cover the entire scene, it's, it works too close. Or when you get caught, go the other way. Especially, especially when it's a bomb incident. You see the bomb check running? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the thing of it is, is, it is very difficult for us without specialty equipment and training to truly stabilize these, these incidents. So what do we do? We stay the hell away from them. Okay? And again, we have a whole chapter on hazmat. Um, you guys will do a, a practical on hazmat, um, where we'll put you in a simulated uh, incident. So you guys can kind of get used to thinking about this stuff type of stuff. Do not enter it unless it's safe to do so. That includes if people are dropping right in front of you. When we get to the hazmat chapter, we're going to show you guys a video of someone who broke that rule. Okay, so... Um, it is a very difficult decision to make to be watching people drop in front of you and know that I gotta sit here and just watch it because there's really nothing I can do. So what, what happens if you go running into that? You're gonna be victim number next. Okay. Alright, so electricity. Any licensed electricians in here? That's what I thought. Every once in a while we get somebody to be like, you know, what? Okay, great, you can fix this stuff. I can't. Okay. So it's beyond our scope. So what do we do? We mark it off and we stay away from it. Okay. So lightning, it is a myth that lightning cannot strike in the same place twice. It absolutely can because electricity follows the path of least resistance, right? That path stays the same, follow the same path. You guys remember on Jeopardy, which direction does a lightning bolt travel, up or down? It actually comes up from the ground. Yeah, if you get on YouTube and watch some of that, you'll, you'll, they'll slow it way down, and you'll actually see it travel up from the ground. Coolest damn thing. <laughs> so um, keep in mind that a lightning strike does not have to hit you in order to hurt you. It just has to hit somewhere near you. Because the ground itself, there's water in the ground, so that means that it can conduct electricity. So um, next one we'll talk about is fire. Um, I use myself as an example. The 
firefighter's nerve, I'll make sure the fellow's backing up on this. Um, a minimally trained firefighter is, or when I went through the minimum was 24 hours. I think it's went up to 40 now. 40 per minute? Is that nearly enough? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. So, people who fight fires for either a living or as a glorified hobby go through hundreds of hours of training about how to keep themselves safe in a burning environment. And they still screw it up, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> when you think about it, though, this is a steel tank. I'm betting this picture is not new. <laughs> Um, a lot of those old guys, they'll be like, well, I want to have my hood off so I can feel how hot it is. Well, I got news for you, dumbass. It's hot. It's on fire. <laughs> That's the SBA. On the What's that? SBA. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so those of you who haven't seen one, this is what we're talking about is that tank, and then it leads up there's a hose that leads that tank. Um, but we will actually put you in the set so that way you can really get the full meal deal appreciation. Um, so fire is not only the only hazard you have to deal with. What kills most fire victims? Smoke inhalation. Um, oxygen deficiency. Um, I'm trying to remember the old joke was where if, if you were trying to figure out what was a, a hazmat incident that the the cop was unconscious but the vehicle was running, it was uh, hazardous materials. If both of them were, were dead, it was an oxygen deprivation or something. I can't remember what it was. But, um, so I mean, fire burns up oxygen in the room. We need oxygen to breathe, so even if we're not necessarily um, in a high temperature environment, we may be in a low oxygen environment. So next going to be toxic gases, the biggest one being cyanide and hydrogen sulfide. Those things are uh, incredibly deadly. Uh, cyanide poisoning has a 100% mortality rate if not treated properly. So it's, it's deadly. All right. So we have to use that proper protection. So, next thing we'll talk about is vehicle crashes, probably one of the more common uh, calls you'll go on. Uh, big thing we have to worry about there is traffic. We have a term called the rubbernecker. Have you ever heard that term before? Absolutely. I want to see what's going on. Well, where the head goes, the body goes, right? So, if the head turns to look at something, what goes to the steering wheel? It goes towards it. So traffic is incredibly, incredibly dangerous. Anyone here ever been struck by traffic during a response? I don't say I was within inches, and I've watched two other people actually get hit. Um, luckily, it was just uh, like rear view mirrors. <coughs> Were you like hit directly, or? <laughs> How big your truck? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I bet so. Yeah, part, part. I'm going to assume it was before March, so I, it wasn't me. Yeah, <laughs> it was hilarious. It was part, and it went to go try with me. So, I, I get I, it. Actually, that brings up a very good point. Yeah, we see the red racer strike once in a while. Yeah. Yeah. Um, traffic does not necessarily only mean the public. It can also be other responders. Um, probably one of the most common accident uh, for responding emergency units is they strike another emergency unit at an intersection because they're both focusing on where they're the end goal of where they're going. They're not thinking about the intersection. Uh, unstable vehicles. If it's been crashed, it's probably unstable until you take some steps to fix that. <coughs> it's upside down on its side on a hill, on ice. I've watched a fire engine slide down a hill on ice. That was cool. It was cool because I was like 200 feet away. <laughs> it sucked for the guy that was in it. Uh, there was just enough slope, it was just slippery enough, he just slid right down the hill. Um, we sent him home for a new set of underwear. So, down power lines. Here's another one of those things you're going to remember. The, di the isolation distance is two spans of poles, okay? So if 
You have a pole here that's down. Two more poles is the closest you want to get to it until the power has been controlled. The reason for that is if it's laying on the ground, remember the ground has moisture in it and can conduct electricity. So we want to stay at least two spans away. And we talked quite a bit about sharks, but we don't think we need to go through that again. So protective clothing, it's there for a reason. Okay, There may be times working EMS that you're putting on uh, bunker style gear. Uh, so be familiar with it. Not only for the sake of you may put it on, but you may have to take it off of someone. You won't have to be fumbling with it when there's a, you know, one of your guys that you work with every day is laying there not breathing, okay? You want to be able to get good at getting turn out here off of people. Um, cold weather, this is more for your, your protection. Dress in layers. Um, I hate the winter simply because I am always either too hot or too cold. Because you think about it, it's what, 70, 72 degrees in here, right? We get a run, we go out to the bay, which is about 65 degrees. We get in the truck with the heaters on. By the time we get to scene, it's about 95. Because we want it warm, because we don't want our patients getting cold. We get out into the, the open air, which is four below. We're out there for two or three minutes. Then we go into a nursing home. How old do they keep nursing homes? 105. Yeah, I, I swear Saint sets their thermostat. Right? Incredibly warm. Then we go in there and we work on a patient for 15, 20 minutes. We get a good sweat going. We go outside into the negative four degree outside, back into the 95 degree truck, out into the four degree things in the ER, then back into the 90 degree hospital. So it's just constant up and down, up and down. So if you dress in layers, you're going to be able to shed layers and put them on as you need to um, be able to get around that. Otherwise, your day is going to be really miserable if you show up in a, you know, a real heavy sweatshirt. That's it. Or vice versa, if you all used to be showing up just a uh, polo shirt. Uh, turnout gear. Uh, again, that sometimes called bunker gear. It's a specialty gear. It's layered in itself. Um, you may find yourself wearing it um, if you're in an area where there's heat, fire, sparks, things like that. Um, if nothing else, if you remember one thing from this, remember that you don't swim in bunker gear. If you're anywhere near water, the bunker here comes off. Uh, just fooling around once, we did that when we were doing ice rescue at the end of the week. I stepped into the water in the bunker here, and it is it is like someone's grabbing you and trying to pull you down. I mean, it's an incredible amount of weight. So gloves, have a set of gloves available to you. Because you may have to um, get in somewhere where there's a sharp glass or something like that. You don't want to cut your hands. Um, ambulances are supposed to carry a helmet for each crew member. Sometimes they disappear. Um, I've had some, some partners that carry their own helmet. Each their own, I guess. Um, me, I just like to be able to have one available. So I'm not above borrowing a helmet if need be. Uh, boots. If you're going to make this a career and you want to spend money, that's where you spend it. Full-time emergency response is all about the footwear. Don't go cheap on boots. It'll be the worst thing you ever did for yourself. Um, you're going to spend two, three hundred dollars on a good set of boots. It's worth every time. If you can get steel toed, they say that's preferred. Anybody here wear steel toed boots on a daily basis? Yeah. How comfortable are they? No, they so because they're what they're heavy, right? Um, they are coming out with some carbon fibers and things like that. Different materials that are making them lighter. With still having that protection, so again, spend the money, get good boots. Ear, eyes, nose, and skin. I mean, the thing is, think about this stuff again. You guys was talking about how I had a little go bag in my truck when I was volunteering. It had sunblock and foam earplugs and stuff like that in it. An extra pair of, uh, an extra full outfit as far as jeans and a shirt. Because what happens when you work a house fire for the first you know 40 minutes and you take your gear off, you're all sweaty, right? Boy, was it nice to be able to get into my truck and change it to dry clothes. You know, it's worth a little bit of time. So have these things available to you. If your service offers it, or if you can get your hands on it in any way, shape, or form, dangerous world out there, guys. Just that's a dangerous world out there. Um, 
Yeah, people are stupid. People are unstable. You play this, you, you do this long enough, you will have a firearm pointed at you. It's the way it is. So if you can get your hands on some best, I strongly suggest that you do. Um, simply because it's just one more way you can make sure you go home again. Unfortunately, it's expensive, and it's another one of those things, again, spend the money, get the good stuff. All right, so we're going to change gears again. So any questions on that scene size of stuff? Does that make sense? So now we're going to start actually taking care of people. One of the biggest ways to keep people from getting scared or, or anxious is to give them information. Let them know who you are and what you're going to be doing. Um, Olivia, I'm actually going to pick on your, you, uh, your dad a little bit. When he had his crash, he came in and did an in-service for this about us. About this for us. Um, he popped another vehicle. Everybody's going off, all this kind of stuff. He's like, for the first few moments, he was really confused. He didn't know where he was, didn't know what was going on. Okay, so you've got a guy that's trained in defensive tactics, is carrying multiple firearms, and is confused. You may want to let him know who you are. Because if we just suddenly came up and started grabbing at him and doing, doing our job, what's he going to do? He's going to fight back. Now, is he a, I mean, he's a great example of this, but he's not the only one. People who get confused, they tend to become combative just simply because they're in their mind, they're defending themselves. A lot of times just simply saying, hey, I'm so-and-so, I'm with, I'm with the fire department, or I'm so-and-so, I'm with the EMS. That's enough to kind of clear people's minds. Okay. Um, let your patient know that, they're, that you're attending to their needs. It's okay, we're going to get this taken care of. Take a breath, relax, we're going to get this fixed for you, okay? Um, again, calm and chaos are contagious. You can calm your patient down and think it's so much easier for them. Some things you'll see out of those critical patients. By far, the biggest one is anxiety. Again, to us, it's just another run, right? Just another chart. To them, it's the worst day of their life. Even those people that, you know, it's, you know they're full of crap. Yes, they're having a seizure. We've all been there, right? But to their family members, they think it's real, right? And they're terrified. So we have to um, expect that. Pain and fear. Anyone here ever been the patient? Were you terrified? Were you hurting? Were you, yeah. yeah. You're like, you know, holy crap, am I, am I going to, you know, is this going to last forever? Am, am I going to be okay? That kind of stuff, right? We have to expect that and then deal with it. Anger and hostility. Probably the question we get to ask most, ask most often is, what took you so long to get here? I, I want to say, well, listen, do Dad, I haven't really invented teleportation yet. And I use a different word instead of do Dad. That's what's going on in my head. Outside, it's okay, well, no, we got here as soon as we could. We were coming from a different town, things like that. Um, so, yeah, they may be very hostile towards you for just simply trying to do your job. Sometimes that anger may not necessarily be because of you, but you're the person that they can yell at. People who are about to go to jail, a lot of times, they take it out on whoever they can. That gets to be us. Um, depression, especially with the, the people who are chronically sick, they become depressed. So it's like, oh, they don't care. And they, they can get very hard to deal with. Uh, dependence, people get very clingy and very whiny because they, they, they've been overwhelmed. Something is overwhelming them. And again, you're that white knight, right? They, they called those three numbers and you showed up. You're there to fix their problem. So they're going to try to lean on you pretty heavy. Um, guilt. This is especially auto accident. Especially when it's a fatality. Oh my God, I killed that person. That's a tough conversation to have. 
especially if that person isn't just a stranger. That person may have been their wife or their their son. You're going to have to deal with that. And you're going to have to find a way to get them through that. The next one's my personal favorite, mental health problem. The single fastest growing portion of health care. People are nuts. <laughs> Simple. They're nuts. Um, I, there'll be times where it, it's, it's hard to make it make sense. You know, you, you know, you'll find yourself charting patient stated he was the warrior from Maldor and was going to uh, eradicate the Smurfs. Okay. I've had a guy to tell me he had 13 hearts. Okay. How are they all doing? <laughs> you know, um, probably one of my favorite ones that we got called to a, a trailer park just around the corner from one of our stations. And uh, we, of course, were first one there. Middle of the night, I knock on the door, door opens, I'm off to the side, because we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, and all of a sudden, I'm staring at a guy that he had to have been 6'10 in an easy 350 pounds of just rock solid muscle. This dude was a beast. So I'm staring at him like this. And I'm like, so what seems to be the problem today, sir? I want to kill somebody. I'm not on that list. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> he goes, no, you're cool. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go pee. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, turns out, luckily, the guy, you know, he didn't actually kill anybody, but um, he was absolutely whacking. What's that? Prince Charles' sister. Oh, yeah? <laughs> really? I didn't realize we had royalty in town. Yeah. You guys have a parade or something for <laughs> July 4th. Come on down. <laughs> Uh, people that receive bad news, especially death notifications, um, all bets are off. <laughs> they do all kinds of weird things. Everything from screaming, yelling, running around, to just going comatose. We kind of have to prepare for that. So how do we talk to these people? How do we fix this? We try to avoid sad and grim comments. Again, that's the word avoid, not completely eliminate. Sometimes you just have to say it. Uh, but do uh, you necessarily have to tell the guy that, yeah, all they're going to do is cut your arm off? Don't tell him that they won't. Do you have to mention it? Maybe not. Why, why stir it up? Uh, orient your patient. Okay, tell them, you know, if they're confused, you know, hey, it's, it's okay. This is what happened. Um, we're going we're, we're gonna to take care of you. Make sure they kind of can piece things together. Be honest with them. If they ask, are they going to be able to put my arm back on? Be honest with them. I don't know. So we're going to try to get, at least to give them the chance. Okay, something like that. Don't try to put a sugar coating on it. Be like, oh, yeah, 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 they'll fix it right up. It's cool. No problem. You don't know whether they can put that back on. So just tell them what it is. Okay. Um, if they ask, okay, is that guy in the other car dead? Yeah. Um, that sometimes falls into the, well, you know, I, my partner's taking care of him. They're doing everything they can. You kind of avoid the subject. But they're staring at a very, very dead guy. You know, I mean, don't try to, to, to lie to them, um, especially little kids. Little kids will spot your lies so fast it's not funny. The biggest one being, is this going to hurt? Yes, it's going to hurt a little bit. If you tell them, no, it's not going to hurt, and then it hurts, they ain't going to trust you for the rest of their lives. Um, you may deal with a possible refusal of care initially. They may tell you, go get bent. I don't, want, I don't want anybody. You may have to sit there and kind of smile and keep trying a new approach to let, get them to actually let you take care of it. We'll talk more about that when we get to medical legal. Um, so involve the family, um, especially siblings. A lot of times people, they forget the siblings. Um, they're involved in this as well. So uh, make sure that they're kept up to speed. 
Because again, it, if nothing else, you'll avoid someone driving Mach 5 into the hospital for a stub toe. So I'm going to three at that one. Kim was really good at that. Um, yeah, Kim's very good about that. She got okay about that. Wow, she in, like, it's like every five minutes she talks to family. And, you know, and, to be honest with you, a big portion of this job is just simply talking. So, little kids, um, if possible, have a responsible adult travel with the kid. Uh, it makes your life so much easier, if you, especially if that uh, responsible adult happens to be a parent. We'll talk more about consent when we get into the medical legal chapter, but it is a very good idea to have that. If nothing else, does the kid know you? No, you're a stranger. What do we, what do we teach little kids from about as old as they can say the word stranger? Danger. Stranger danger, right? Strangers are bad. Stay away from them. And unless they're in a uniform, then they're cool. That doesn't really jive with little kids. Especially not when you show up in your pajamas. Like every once in a while you have to, right? So, every once in a while you're going to feel the death of a child. Um, these are tough. Not only for you, but also for pretty much everyone around you. Um, help that family any way you can. You know, Get them a glass of water. Shut their door for them. And, you know, answer the phone. Things like you know, anything you can do uh, to make them more comfortable. And then kind of feed off what they give you back. If people are screaming and yelling and carry on, sometimes you just have to let them scream and yell and carry on. Just keep them safe. Let them work it out. And then you can come in and do what you need to do afterwards, as far as the paperwork and things like that. Uh, prepare the parents. Get them somewhere quiet, away from everybody else, that kind of thing. Um, to be able to make this a as easy a conversation as it can be. It's never going to be an easy conversation, but it'd be easier if it's not in front of a crowd. So we do deal with a lot of death and dying, unfortunately. Not all rose, you know, petals and, and puppy dogs. Um, the death usually going to occur one of two ways. It's either going to be suddenly, or it's going to be after a prolonged illness. Okay, and they're going to be know it's coming. Each one of those kind of has its own flair on how you handle things. A lot of times with prolonged terminal illnesses, it's, okay, no, I'm sorry, grandma's dead. Oh, okay, well, we kind of knew that was coming. Um, you know, do you need me here to sign something? I mean, I've had people say that. It's like, okay, I'm not the UPS guy. Okay. <laughs> um, it was what I was thinking. It's like, okay, no, but they came to terms with it. They knew it was coming. They've already done their portion. Which brings us to the Kubler Ross stages of grieving. You guys need to know these. Learn them, love them. Keep in mind that they're named after a doctor, Elizabeth Kubler Ross, who kind of found these out uh, by uh, interviewing uh, people who had suffered a loss. And what she found was that every all of them went through the same five stages, not necessarily the same order. Sometimes somebody would um, have a very long stage of one and a very short of the other, but they all reported these same five things. Uh, the first one we'll talk about is denial, and that's the no, 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 this, this isn't real. No, she's not dead, that kind of thing. Um, especially the this is where you, you know, you have cancer. Well, no, I'm going to get a second opinion, and a third, and a fourth, and a fifth, because they don't, they, they don't want to come to terms with it. The next will be anger, okay, which is, it's, it's, instead of denial, which is like, not me, anger is more like, why me? What did I do to deserve this? It was your damn fault. You would have done blah, 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 I wouldn't be dying, that kind of thing, or she wouldn't be dead. So that may end up getting directed at us. You have to kind of diffuse that and maybe even divert it to, to what the real issue is. The next is bargaining, which is the, well, I haven't this, or, well, if I only this. Where it's, they're, they're trying to barter their way out of it. Right? This is real big on the, you know, the, the well, I... I can't, I can't have cancer because my daughter's getting married next month. I, I have to do that in order. Um, 
or if she didn't get to do this before she died. It's, it's a kind of a, a, a way to try to defer dealing with the actual gravity of the event. Um, the next is depression. It, it's just a sadness. It's, uh, you know, they they become very distraught and detached. And then finally is acceptance. It's okay. This 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 is real, this is happening. I can deal with this. Alright. Sometimes these will all happen right in front of you. Sometimes none of them will happen in front of you. These can take days, weeks, months, sometimes years to fully work itself through. But don't be surprised if you see at least some of all of those five while you're on scene with these people. So, everybody got these written down pictures, something? Because you need to know these. All right. So, what's our role? First off, try to find out what you can do to help them. You may not be able to make the problem go away, but you may be able to do at least something to make things better. Again, that glass of water, but can you turn my phone off? Something like that. Reinforce reality. You have to kind of say it like it is. Use the terms dead, died, concrete terms. Moved on, passed away, uh, didn't make it. Those things can be misconstrued. So I always tell is, is use the word dead or died. Make it final. This is really what it is, okay? um, which is not easy for either person. But eventually, you have to get to that point. It's actually better to just start right at that point. Be honest. A lot of times you're going to get to questions of, well, did they hurt? Did they suffer? You're going to be tempted to say, no, 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 they didn't. You don't know that. Um, and there may be evidence that comes out afterwards that proves you wrong which makes it just that much more difficult for the person to cope with this. So just tell them, honestly, I don't know. Or but most likely no. Or you know, that kind of stuff. Um, if you're really thinking that yes, they laid there for hours and hurt, that's where you maybe start redirecting. You kind of point the conversation in a different direction. So you don't have to answer the question. The biggest thing there is just simply don't sugarcoat that. Uh, and then allow the patient and their family to grieve. Let them do it in their own way. Um, I've had families that literally said, um, okay, well, I need to go back and do the dishes. Okay, well, doing the dishes is what makes you feel better about this? Fine, go, let's go do the dishes. Some people, they want to be surrounded by a group. Some people don't. Don't leave people completely alone. Okay, does that mean I have to be right here? No, that's creepy, right? Yeah. Be at least in visual and, and auditory contact. Because you don't know what they're going to do. So at least you want to be there to kind of have that stuff off. Okay? All right, so some kind of don't says. Um, things like give it time, it'll get better. Um, anybody here ever lost somebody really close to them? Does it ever really get better? Are they ever really truly you're over it? Um, you shouldn't question God's will. Problem is, not everybody believes in the same God or God at all. Um, so that's another one of those things. Religion is, unless you really know the person, that kind of thing, it, it, it's not a good place to go. Okay? Because you don't know what their beliefs are. Um, you have to get on with your life, or you can have another baby. That's probably the other big one that goes on our head. <laughs> Think about being on the other side of that state. But yeah, that can get yeah, that can devolve very quickly. Um, the one that I see people most often do is I know how you feel. You have no idea how that person. Could you have been in a similar situation? Absolutely. So just tell them, well, I've been in something similar, and this is what I felt. But not, I know what you feel. You don't know what you feel. That's another one where you end up getting screamed at and punched. That, that's an outer gate right there. Um, some things that you can try, I probably say this in every death scene is I'm sorry for your life. 
I can't do anything about this, but I'm sorry. Um, it's okay to be angry. It's okay to be sad. It's okay to be. It's okay to laugh. Some people actually start laughing. Um, it's just the, the way they get out of motion. People that are very, very good at dealing with death and dying. Um, so if you guys ever get a chance to work with some chaplains or something like that, um, they will actually get families laughing. Um, I've been lucky enough to get this to work once. Um, uh, it was a person that I knew somewhat, uh, and the guy was just a complete goofball. So before we know it, we're swapping stories about the dumb crap that this guy did when he was alive. And before you know it, we're all kind of hooting and hollering, carrying on about you know, you know all this wacky stuff that he did. Um, so it, it's okay to do anything, okay, to be anything. If that's the real take on that. Um, you know, this is hard for you to accept. This must be painful. Um, how are you feeling? Are you okay? Tell me, is there something I can do? That's okay to ask those questions. Um, and, you know, people really care for, use their name. I've actually watched someone, and it was from across the room, so I couldn't see. It was like, give everyone those moments where it's like, this was one of those moments. It's like, don't do it. Um, it was a, a police officer, um, and it was a really hectic scene, and uh, the family had came up and said, well, so, so what happened? And they said, ah, yeah, he's dead. And they were like, well, who's dead? And he had so it's kind of like, is that really? Yeah, we worked really hard. <laughs> it's amazing the power a name has. You know, um, so you know, if you had somebody who was trying to sell you a car, okay, so take on you too. I'm going to sell you a car. Right, so I'm like, hey, sweet, what you need? You need car. Seriously, maybe not. You need car. I'm not. How does that come across? Yeah, yeah awkward. <laughs> and are you inviting me? Absolutely not. Because I don't even know this is a game. Right? Hey, sir, I'm going to We talk a lot about this. I really think this is the card for you. That's a lot more likely to get some engagement and agreement, right? Because it shows that you actually give a crap. You're not just going through motion. All right, so. Everybody here have a cell phone on them, most likely? No, somebody doesn't. It's not a big deal if you don't. If you do, I want you to find a picture of the person that is most important to you in your life. And pull that picture up. Does it have to be one person? Nope. It can be your entire family if you want, or group of friends, puppy dog, whatever. Especially that one. So if you don't have one, it's not the end of the deal. Just kind of think of whoever that person may be. So everybody got something? At least pretty close? All right. So I want you to pair up. And you're going to tell the other person who, you know, they're going to be like, hey, this is my most important person. You're going to tell them that that person has died. Yeah. Trust me, you want to be awkward and, and stutter and stammer, you want to do it here. I'm going to kind of walk around and listen to you as you do it. Maybe I'll offer a few little tips and tricks and things like that. Um, but it's really easy to kind of take this as a joke and be like, you did. Done. You know. <laughs> I want you to kind of take this as a practice run. Okay? You, you marry very well. The moment you get your cert, the first thing you have to do is death notification. You get called to, you know, an unknown problem. You get there and the guy's been dead for three days. Is there a thing you're going to do about that? No? Are you going to be able to stall the family for the next 20 minutes while somebody else gets there? No, you're going to have to deal with this. All right? So pair up. I don't care with who. Um, if you guys want to even trade around a little bit, that's fine. But let's do some death notifications. <laughs> There's one odd person. 
Um, I can pull something up on my phone if I can be the, the recipient for you if you want. So, if you need me.
uh, especially if it's like an auto accident with a lot of people involved. Uh, has anyone ever, and it's been quite a while, but there was the Taylor uh, University incident where there were two people that were switched. You may remember that. It's been quite a while. Um, it's still a big issue in the, the coroner world. Um, they actually changed the laws because of this incident. Uh, there were two girls that looked very similar to each other. One family was notified that their daughter was in the hospital. The other was notified that their daughter was dead. Well, come to find out they were the other way around. Um, there was a, wow. the, the guy that did that actually had made a suicide note. It, this really messed with him. So if you're going to be doing these types of notifications, do your homework first and know that that is actually who that is if at all possible. And if you can even come into, you know, uh, you know I, I know my name is Steve. Um, I understand that your wife's name is Jenna. I understand that she's her name is Jenna. And it's like, okay, yes. Yeah. So now I know I'm talking to the right person. Because, um, especially when you start talking to girlfriends and things like that, where it's, um, is it impossible for me to have an 18 year old girlfriend? Yeah. <laughs> 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 but seriously, um, is that theoretically impossible? No. no. But if there was an 18 year old girl dead and we're both standing there, and we both appear to be family, which one would you assume was Jenna's husband? Yeah, right? The age is much closer. It may actually be. So don't be shy too about making sure that who you're talking to is actually who you think you're talking to. I don't know. You might steal it before you get her married or something. <laughs> the other thing is, is journalists can get dirty. You may be talking to a reporter. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, that sucks. But it, it's happened before. Where they claim to be family to get an inside scoop. I think there's a special place in hell for those people. But that does happen. So, all right. Back to it. Somebody else is watching. Yeah, 
Wish you could kind of All right, so I get a chance to watch you guys go through one real quick. You guys good with it? Yeah. yeah. You guys need to take a break? Or you want to kind of push through? I'm good to go. Good to go? All right. I hear no other objections. Going once, going twice? In a half hour. In a half an hour? In a half hour. Look at this. No, three minutes. Half hour will take like a three minute break. In a half hour. Oddly specific. <laughs> <laughs> I sense there's something going on. Okay, all right. You guys keep track of that. <laughs> all right, so the general adaptation syndrome. One of those things you need to know. How does the body react to stress? The first stage is the alarm stage. The body says, whoa, something's wrong here. And it reacts. The sweaty palms, um, you know, that kind of stuff. Eye dilation, all that. That acute stuff. After a while, it goes into either reaction or resistance. So it starts trying to fight whatever it is off or run away from it. So it's reacting or resisting. If that goes on long enough, one of the other two things is going to happen. It's either going to be recovery. Which they're going to get better, they're going to get over it, or they go into exhaustion, which their body simply can't overcome it anymore, and you start to see a deterioration in their state of well. Make sense? So, general adaptation syndrome, alarm, reaction, recovery. Make sense? So, some signs of stress, especially in the alarm stage, increased respirations and heart rate, increased blood pressure. Cool, clammy skin. Everybody, I mean, everybody felt somebody was clammy, that kind of dead fish feeling. Yeah. Um, dilated pupils, tense muscles. This seems pretty, you know, common sense, right? Uh, increased blue, blood glucose level. The body is trying to do one of three things: fight. Fight or fright. What we mean by that is that the body is going to try to fight it off, run away from it, or freeze. One of those three things is going to happen anytime someone is suddenly stressed. Now, by those, we don't necessarily always mean literally. Okay, so if I come up and went, you know, like, boogie, 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 or something. <laughs> <laughs> You know, he may be like, okay, whatever, dude, you know, um, which he's pushing me away, which in by essence is flight, right? You're trying to generate space. Um, haunted houses have had to change how they do things. They used to be able to come out and grab people way back in the day. 
They no longer do that because workers' comp got so expensive because people punched their workers. You know, so I come up and go, ah, they get so many, bam, they pop in the nose. And now they never come within arm's length. So you guys have to go through an honor house and wonder why that is. That's why. Um, and then fright is sometimes called freeze. So has anybody ever actually I mean, had something like really scare the crap out of you and you just froze? Yeah? Um, if you really think about it, when a possum plays dead, that's what they're doing. Yeah. That's a defense mechanism. All right. So all of this stuff basically boils down to that fight, fight, or fright. Um, because increased blood glucose level, if we were going to run away or um, fight something off, we would want to have more energy available to us, right? To our muscles. The body prepares for that. Perspiration, do we want to keep our body cool because we may be fighting and struggling stuff? Absolutely. Tense muscles, you guys kind of see where this is going. The other thing is decreased blood flow to the gastrointestinal tract. We need to be able to digest our last meal while we're running from a bear. No, it takes kind of a secondary thing, right? Do we need to be able to poop while we're fighting for our lives? No. So the body shunts blood away from those non-essential organs and sends them to the organs that it does think it's going to be. So some situations that may cause a lot of stress. Um, anything that's very dangerous. So uh, combative patients, rescues that are... Um, like special ops rescues things, high angles, stuff like that. Um, any physical or psychological demand. Um, when you're having to do something that is very strenuous, like CBR, it stresses your body. Um, any critically ill or injured patients, people that are very, very sick or injured, it, it, it amps things up. Um, dead and dying patients, anytime somebody dies, you're going to be a little bit amped up. It's just the way it is. Um, overpowering sights, smells, and sounds. I, my first fatal house fire was about a month after I came on with the department. Way back in the day. It was, the person, the one was, uh, he'd been drinking and was passed out before the fire even started. Um, the other was in a wheelchair and was unable to get out. So both of them were pretty much burnt up by the time we got to them. I haven't eaten barbecue chicken since. The smell of barbecue chicken makes me want to vomit. Because my brain goes to seeing this lady in a wheelchair frozen in time like this. But she was on her chair. Because you know? she was trying to get up the window. That's where my brain goes. So there's even occasions where, where I'm, just, I'm just there for a fire standby. And if I catch a whiff, that image goes into my so, um, just simply a sight or a smell or a sound sometimes can be enough to trigger that um, general adaptation syndrome where the body tries to react to stuff. Multiple patient situations, um, especially when it gets to be very big. Uh, people that, there's a extremely high suicide rate to people who have responded to things like Hurricane Sandy or Katrina. Katrina, especially because the response didn't go over well, um, at least not initially. Uh, so those very, very big incidents um, really can kind of mess people up. Uh, having to deal with angry patients, family, or bystanders, um, again, that, that anger gets pushed towards us, but it really shouldn't. So eventually that wears on you. Um, the unpredictability of the job. Boy, I would love to be able to go home at 7 o'clock in the evening every time. I bat about 500. I get off on that. Certain crews, like the day crew we have, you know, you know, 44, they probably shoot closer to about a quarter of the time they go home on time. That sucks. <laughs> you know, because you never know when you're going to go home. Um, the volunteer side gets even worse. Because you never know when you're going to get called out. You know, it always seems to happen when you have a plate of hot food in front of you. 
My wife, for the longest time, thought I hated her cooking because every time she cooked something, I got up and left. No, honey, I just happened to be getting paged all the time. Um, <laughs> so, non critical patients or non 911 patients, the frequent flyers, or as the new term is, the super user. These people that call for crap. You know, the, I, I, I had you know, like the one lady that always put her fingers in pop cans. That got old really fast. You know? um, going on the same lady for the same problem over and over again. It gets old. Right? It starts to wear on. Especially, you know, especially for the, 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 the ambulance providers as opposed to the fire department providers. Um, hospital wait time. Things like, really? That transfer has to go right now? It's ten, 10 minutes till the end of my shift and they can't wait to go down to Fort Wayne for a cath they're getting tomorrow. It's old. Sometimes it's not their fault. Sometimes it is. So, move on to um, types of stress reactions. That general adaptation syndrome is looking very big picture. Now we're going to kind of work in a little bit. Um, the first one is an acute stress re reaction. That happens during the event. Okay, that's what happens right now. Most of your reactions are going to be this way. They're going to happen right now, it's going to freak you out, and then you're very quickly going to get back to that state of wellness. All right? Some reactions aren't that way, though. They happen after you have a little bit of time. You kind of digest it and let it in. Um, I think of one, it was my first cardiac arrest, very first cardiac arrest. Ink was still drying on my EMR cert. I literally had gotten it in the mail that day. Well, I lived quite a bit on the outside of our uh, district, so I was one of the last ones there. So everybody was kind of doing their thing by the time I got there. So my job was to stick with the family. Well, come to find out, it was, um, there was this little girl off to the side here, and then the guy that we were working. Um, so she kind of comes up and asks, you know, what are they doing? That kind of thing. So I'm kind of telling her what's going on. I pretty quickly picked up that they were somehow related. So I'm to find out this was this guy's granddaughter. So we were outside of a restaurant. They're doing their thing. Alice comes in and all this. I'm kind of trying to explain that, you know, she asked, why are they hurting him? And she's like, no, they're not hurting him. Kind of, um, come to find out, they were there for her birthday dinner. At the time, I'm kind of like, man, that sucks. The next day is when it hit. I did a play-by-play -play of this for her. Um, so you, there can be some time, but things actually have to kind of set in a little bit. Um, unfortunately, this is where we see a lot of suicide. Because by now, the people have just had an acute stress reaction. They've went on, they've moved on. So these people, then they go off by themselves, this hits them, and that's when they start to do things that can hurt themselves. Okay. Um, the next type of reaction is a cumulative stress reaction. And these are where it's over and over and over again. Um, we see this a lot in urban EMS, where it means, you know, we may take two or three calls a shift, and that's a pretty steady shift. You go to Fort Wayne, you're going to be taking 10, 12 calls a shift every time. And it's just over one right after another after another. And it just keeps building until it, it causes that stress. So um, this can even be over the, the course of a career. A lot of times people, are, you know, they, they burn out and they, they leave the career just simply because it's, this isn't funny. I don't want to do this anymore. Because it, I'm tired of looking at people that are sick and dead and all that. So, um, it takes years for this to slowly build up. Leading into um, the portion of stress that gets the most space time, uh, which is post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, it's a relatively new diagnosis uh, in mental health, um, but it's, it's becoming very, very prominent as we're starting to look for it. What we found out was way back as early as World War I, there were people that were documented having these symptoms. We just didn't have a name for it. 
Uh, so now that we've actually got this diagnosis, we're going to start treating it. Uh, how we would normally treat it is what's called a critical incident stress management system. Uh, sometimes they call them meetings or whatever, um, where people get together and they bring in. Uh, see, we here have been a part of a CISM meeting. Um, basically, what it does is they bring in some people from mental health. They bring in the people that were on the incident. They bring in some administrators and some other responders that weren't involved in the incident that are trained in uh, helping people through these type of stress. And you kind of all sit there and they just say, okay, hey, this is what happened. And it's not a critique of, okay, well, we should have done this better. Or they, well, actually, they'll, they'll redirect you as somebody starts talking that way. Like, no, 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 we, we don't want to do a critique. We just want to talk about how we feel about it. We just give people a chance to get this stuff out. Um, usually they do what's called a defusing, actually on scene. Uh, a lot of you guys have probably already been on one of these and not known it. It can be as simple as, you good? You guys good? Technically, that was a critical stress is defusing. Just like real quick check in and be like, okay, are we good? Do we need to talk about something? Do we need to take next steps? Um, the meetings that I was kind of talking about before was usually what's called a debriefing where it's a bit more formal, it's a couple of days after the event, um, and it gives people a really a chance to kind of let things set in and really get their feelings worked out. If, going back to that, it is perfectly okay for this to work for you. It is perfectly okay for this to not work for you. There are some people where this is just completely not what they need. They need to go shove trees around or whatever they need to do. I always urge you if you are get you if you are asked to be a part of this, even if you're one of those people where it's like this is not going to help me, go anyway. It may not help you through it, but it may help the person sitting next to you, just to simply know they're not alone. Okay. So some warning signs, things that are like, okay, well we got a problem here. Irritability towards your coworkers, family, or friends. Okay, where you were normally were a real nice guy, you now you're a real wiener. Basically, any, any of these, if you just simply look at it, it was a marked change. Something's abruptly changed. That's, that's a problem. Um, inability to concentrate. Inability to make decisions. So the indecisiveness where it's, um, especially if it's, they make a decision and it doesn't go well, whether it was a mistake or not, it just doesn't end well, they're probably not going to be very good about making the decision the next time okay? due to that stress that they saw that was poorly. Uh, difficulty sleeping or increased sleeping, any real drastic change in your sleep pattern. Uh, nightmares. Nightmares are a dead ringer. And, 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 and you, need to, you need to do something. Because that's your brain replaying. All right. so what's happening is now you're going through it over and over again. Okay, so if you're having nightmares, by all means, you need to talk to somebody. Uh, feeling sadness, anxiety, or guilt. Uh, yeah, that's pretty straightforward. Loss of any interest, whether it be food, sex, um, interaction with people, interest in work. You know, so you have that guy that um, he makes every run, he makes every truck check meeting, he makes every business meeting, and now all of a sudden you haven't seen him in three weeks. <laughs> Alarm's going off. Okay. Something changed there. Um, increased use of alcohol. Okay, they're going out and getting bent, you know, getting bent up all every weekend. That's a problem. Same thing with the recreational drug use. Drug use. Um, even if it's um, prescription drugs, but they're taking them in a much in a different fashion. You know, somebody that they may be on Xanax anyway, but now instead of taking one, they're taking five. Uh, physical symptoms, big, a lot of them mean chronic pain. Uh, headaches are probably the biggest one, uh, but back aches a lot of times, or just general pain happens a lot. Uh, hopelessness, like why bother, that kind of thing. Um, they kind of become Eeyore. Um, that's another you know, warning sign thing. And finally, a suicidal ideation. If they even mention the word suicide or ending it all or anything like that, that's you go straight to mental health professionals. 
it's um, don't mess around with that. Don't write it off. Don't think that they're just joking. Um, Jeff, our supervisor here, does a great class um, called QPR class. Where it, it's, um, it's really looking at recognizing the symptoms, getting the person to accept help, and then referring them to the right people. Yes. That, that, um, it's a very good class. So if you guys get a chance to, to do that, um, it's definitely worth your time. So some other emotional aspects. I mean, your reactions to things can be tough to deal with. Um, sometimes being that the lack of reaction. Um, I remember the first uh, pediatric death I had. I thought it was kind of weird because it, I didn't really, it was okay, well, I think well, Johnny's dead. Okay. Time to go Burger King. <laughs> you know. Um, after a while, I got to be like, well, what the hell am I? Like, some sort of uh, psychosis or something? What's going on here? Um, it's just it's normal. Sometimes you're not going to have that bar you a real big reaction. So, um, big things, you just have to deal with these feelings if they come. Um, when you are dealing with these kind of things, you know, actually, in the moment, um, you need very, very extreme care in, that, in your words and your actions. Little things can become uh, big incidents very quickly. Um, you know, things like, I know how you feel. Was it a poorly intended thing? No, you didn't mean to make somebody mad. Boy, if you ever get the unfortunate time to get to see somebody say that, boo boo on it, it can get really bad, really bad. Like people in handcuffs. Um, so be very careful about what you do and say. Um, keep in mind that you're going to be being watched the whole time. You're probably going to be being video recorded the whole time you're doing this stuff. Uh, so it's anywhere in public. Um, try to bring a sense of order and stability to what's going on. A lot of times I just simply tell people, just take the first step. Okay. You're going to be walking up to something like this and go, okay, so Let's say right now, um, the hospital has an explosion. At this point, there's probably 120 people in that building just ballparking it. Let's say only half of them are involved. We still have 60 people over there dead and dying, right? And I say, okay, guys, you just got your certs. Go fix it. Who's ready to go? And that's what I thought. I'm like, oh, I'm going to roast her over here. That's a whole lot to take on, right? The key to it is just take that first step. Just give it a try. And then after that, take the second step. You just march your way through it. Okay. By taking that first step, now, instead of just panicking, you're taking action, and then you're going to revert to your training. So by the time we get you done with this class, you're going to be so well trained that you're going to be able to march your way through it. Okay? We already talked about calm and chaos or contagious. I think you guys already get that. But I mean, yeah. Duck on a pond. So um, your patients will react numerous ways. Allow them to react however they need to. Um, everyone is different. So some people are going to laugh. Some people are going to cry. Some people are going to just go comatose. Just let them do what they have to do. Okay, be there to support them. Um, if possible, keep parents and children together. That may not always be possible, so, but if you do have to take them to different places or by different trucks, let, their, let the parents know where their children are and let the children know where their parents are. And make sure they both know that they have someone with them. Because you, who in here has kids? If your kids are being transported in an ambulance other than yours and you're being taken somewhere else, what's going to be a, the primary thing on your mind? It's not going to be your own condition. It's going to be the kids, right? Um, information goes a long way. Um, if by, you're not sure whether a real medical condition exists or if it's just emotional problems, get a hold of your doc, get a hold of a higher level of care, whatever. Bring other people into this and try to figure it out. If you're in doubt as to whether this is just somebody that's anxious and worked up, or is this someone who may be having a heart attack because of the stress of this? When in doubt, treat them as if they're having a medical condition and do a transplant. So 
So violence. A lot of things cause violence. The big thing, you know, civil disturbances, you know, the LA riots. Um, I actually got to, to drink beers with a guy that was in the LA riots. He, he worked a theme park down there and he got caught up in it. Uh, he said that was the scariest two hours of his life. It took him two hours to finally get home. Uh, he wasn't sure whether he was ever going to make it home. It was neat some of the things he was talking about. Uh, he's like, he goes, I watched four or five murders on the way home. Like, literally watched them. You know? um, big crowds are bad places. Don't get caught up in big crowds. Um, so, if there's a whole bunch of people that are worked up, your job is to back off. Get it stabilized before you go in there. Because once you go in there, now you're a part of it. Mobs can actually pick you up and carry you. Um, anybody ever been in a like a big crowd at an arena or something like that? And got pushed with the crowd. It's an uneasy feeling, isn't it? I mean, he's not a little guy, right? Just tell me, I mean, it, a big crowd. I mean, people just I mean, you have no control over it. So watch big gatherings. Domestic disputes. I will almost play money that if you guys get to have a, a situation that goes violent on you, it's almost exclusively, I should say, it's very, very likely that it's going to be because of the domestic dispute. Two people were already fighting, and you just happened to walk in at the tail end of it, or you talk, walked into round two. Um, be very, very careful on domestic disputes. Do not assume that just because a police officer is there that everything is hunky dory. Police officers do a very good job of separating parties and trying their best to make sure that everything stays the way it's supposed to. But there is only so many of them, and they are still human. Uh, buddy of mine had a time down in Fort Wayne. So he you know, uh, was called to a domestic dispute, um, and the male of the pair was in custody, and they were going to take him in. So he had um, punched her in the face, if I remember right. So that's how EMS ended up getting called. They just wanted her kind of checked out. So they come in, they check her out. She doesn't really want to go. She's just kind of sitting there on a couch. So they're working on getting her refusal. And PD walks through the room with him and cuffs. She reaches down, grabs this great, you ever see those great big glass ashtrays? They're like the size of a plate. Comes up and goes, bam, on this guy's head. Causes a skull fracture, he flops, he's kicking like a fish now, um, and ended up dying. Don't assume that just because they weren't the aggressor, that they won't become the aggressor. Don't assume that just because they're in handcuffs, that there's nothing they can do to you. Yeah. Domestic disputes, your little Ninja Turtle spidey sense is always on. Okay? Uh, because they deteriorate very, very quickly. Uh, same thing with crime scenes, but domestic disputes especially. Any scene that is potentially violent or, or getting out of potential to, have to get out of control, know who's in command. Know who's running the show. Um, we don't want a whole bunch of chiefs and no little Indians in this situation. Okay? Um, if you have any doubt whatsoever, if there's any little voice in the back of your head saying, I should probably have a cop here, get a cop there. Get out and get a cop there. Okay? Don't ignore that little voice. One of the things we'll talk about next Saturday when we do the uh, the hands-on stuff of uh, self-defense is the cover and contact technique. Um, and real quick, we'll just kind of touch on it. What that is is you know, Noah and I are working a patient together, um, and it's getting kind of hinky in here. We don't really know there's a threat yet, but at the same time, it's kind of like something doesn't feel right. I'm going to allow him to take patient care completely on his own. I'm just going to sit back and watch his back. Because if we both get in there and start working, who's watching back here? Nobody is. Okay. Um, I can tell you there was one occasion where I was pushed to the floor on my belly and had somebody thump at me from behind. That was the longest 13 seconds of my life. Um, the cop actually said that that's how long he thought it took him to get across and pick him up. Why it came up an odd number like 13, I don't know. But I trust him. All I knew was I would get my ass um, so make sure that someone is watching your back. Uh, any additional help you think you need, call for it. Um, later in the class, we'll talk about disturbing crime scene evidence. 
Remember, our job is patient care. We do as much patient care as we can without disturbing the scene. But if we get pushed to it, we're going to care for a patient first. The investigators have to figure out what happened. We'll talk a whole lot more about that in the medical meeting. Behavioral emergencies. Um, if they, if there are emergencies that don't have a physical cause. The problem is actually behavioral. So um, there's not really a medical problem. The issue is mental. People are, are we refer to the term as um, they're, you know, sometimes you're going to call them 1096 or, or nothing butts. Okay. Um, these people are unstable. Treat them as such. Uh, this stuff we're going to blow through really fast because I think we really need to go through cultural diversity. Okay, everybody's different. We're better together. Yay! All right, we do have to hit on this though. Sexual harassment. Um, it is a co-ed sport, so uh, we we have to be nice to each other. Um, big thing with this is there's different, uh, one of the most common types of sexual harassment. What's called a quid pro quo situation. That is, if you do this, I'll give you this. Um, like, I'll give you a promotion if we sleep together, or something like that. Obviously, it's a no-no. The things that most likely get people in trouble is when they're creating what's called a hostile work environment, which is it's jokes, comments, inappropriate touching, things like that. Um, if you're not romantically involved, you probably shouldn't be touching them closer than the elbow or the knee. You shouldn't be touching them at all if they don't want it. Uh, substance abuse. Um, big thing with this is is recognize that you're you're stressed, you're relying, you're self-medicating or something like that. Look at you, your your partners and crews, make sure that they're not self-medicating. If they are, there are programs out there called employee assistance programs um, that will help you through that. Uh, big thing is like especially like you know I, uh, most of them here in our area anyway. If you contact the emergency or plus the employee assistance program before any you get caught with any drugs. Usually, you'll keep your job even if you did get caught with drugs. Okay, so it's important that we use these these programs. That's what they're there for. Now, very, very rarely does someone contact them and then still have an incident. That's what they're there for. Suicide prevention, again, 10 times the rate of the general public. We need to be watching each other and making sure that we're not showing signs of uh, cumulative stress. Um, Knock on wood, I have not had any co-workers that have offed themselves. I hope I never do. Because I know that I'll feel an incredible amount of guilt thinking, why didn't I catch this? You know, why didn't I see it coming? So, um, be cognizant, be each other's keeper. Um, illness and injury prevention. Kind of everybody has to be involved with this. We look for problems. Um, we educate people on how to fix them. We put different environmental controls in place if we can. We want to try to keep the issue from happening. All right. We're running a bit behind on time. Our activity took a bit longer than I expected. So are you guys good without doing a review? Okay. Cool. Which, uh, so do we need to take that, what is that, 30 minute break every three minutes or three minutes? I got confused. <laughs> If you guys want to take a couple minutes, we can do that. We probably are not going to get through all of this. We will just finish it out next time. So keep in mind the syllabus is a living, breathing thing, and sometimes it will have to vary some. Oh, I already got it. So if you guys are good with just kind of pushing right through, we can. Are you guys ready? Are your butts hurt? Wow, you guys are a lively bunch. You push it through? All right. All right. Communication is documentation. Communication in itself is simply the transmission of information from one person to the next. It's many different forms. Um, the two big ones are verbal or nonverbal. Either spoken. Or everything else, whether that be body language, tone of voice, um, signals, whatever. It's verbal if it's spoken, it's nonverbal if it's anything else. 
very important to what we do, because most of our job is just simply communicating. Documentation, on the other hand, is written in some way, shape, or form, whether it be electronic or actually handwritten, depending on your service. But it's a legal record of the events that happened. It is a legal document. It can be subpoenaed, and you can be held to it. We want to keep complete and accurate records so that we have a, a, a record of that to remind us should we ever need it. Um, if you were to get sued today, when do you think you'd actually go to court? You would. <laughs> if you've got a very fast track case. It, two to three years. It takes that long the discovery process and all that. Are you going to remember fine, you know, fine details of an event that happened two years ago? Probably not. Okay, so good documentation is your what you out of that. So a lot of our uh, communication is done by radio or telephone. Some of us are done in person. Uh, but you have to get good at all the different means of transferring information. What we want to see is what's called therapeutic communication, where we're actually using the exchange of information to promote resolution of the problem. That quintessential, we're talking them down. Okay? There's a lot to that where you can simply make the problem better by telling the person what's going on and, and, and actually just speaking to it. Um, you guys will probably get a chance to see that in your clinical shifts. There's a lot of times where it, it's, oh, it's, it's hellfire and brimstone until somebody gets there. It may be us, it may be somebody in your department or whatever. Comes in and just says, okay, hey, it's okay, we're going to do this, 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 and this. We're going to bring it down. And now everything goes away and the patient gets better and all this, even though they really didn't do anything. So that's, that's therapeutic communication and action. This we're going to need to know. The Shannon Weaver communication model. What it boils down to is what does it really take to exchange information? First off, the sender has to formulate a message. They have to think of, okay, this is what I want to send out there. They then have to encode it in some form. Usually in the form of words. They then send that message to the receiver by some means, whether it be the radio, um, hand signals, smoke signals, whatever. The receiver then has to decode the message. They have to take it from those words and understand what they mean. So if I put out nothing but uh, the rest of the class in Japanese, am I putting information out there? Absolutely. I'm putting it out there. It, are you guys able to decode it? Probably not. Does anybody here know Japanese? Yeah, yeah. that's about all I know too. Um, so again, the receiver has to be able to decode it. And then finally, the receiver has to repeat the process back, sending feedback to the sender to make sure that what I said is actually what you heard and understand. The kicker to it is noise. Now we think of noise as actual sound. It doesn't always have to be sound, but it's any distraction or disruptor to this process. Um, it can be uh, inability to understand the language or darkness. You know, if it's completely dark and I'm trying to tell you this stuff, it may mean something in the light, right? But if it's dark and you can't see it, that message isn't coming across. So noise in this sense is any disruptor to the communication process. So some things to think about is you know, age, body, uh, language, eye contact, all that kind of stuff. All of these things here can affect communication. Um, probably the biggest one we see in, in EMS is tone of voice and posture or body language. So um, if, you know, let's say Nathan has a problem here, you know, let's throw him. What message am I sending to you? Yeah, I don't give it. But if I came up and said, oh. what message did I send there? I'm genuinely concerned. I use the exact same words both times, right? Tone of voice and, and body language are huge. Um, so every experience that both the receiver and sender have went through, 
affects the communication process. So um, if I'm going to give Mike a message about trout, and his father was killed by a trout, and a horrible accident. Yeah. <laughs> if I say, hey, I'm going to drop off five trout at your house tomorrow night, most people will be like, hey, cool, thanks for dinner. For him, I'm sending five hitmen to his house. Right. So, but, you know, that experience shapes the way that he takes a message. So you have to kind of play that into sometimes um, how you communicate with people. And again, it's it's a gray area, it's a lot of snowflake, uh, everything's different things, but um, you have to kind of learn to read people. That's why it's so important, again, that, that every time you're in a line, start talking to people. Get used to the idea of communicating with people. Uh, your tone, pace, and volume. Not everyone in a nursing home is deaf. You don't have to talk to grandma like this. Man, if I ever go to a nursing home, I'm going to just get driven crazy by people like that. Uh, so keep that in mind that, you know, there's that those things can affect how your message is taken. Uh, a couple of good terms here, ethnocentrism. That is the concept that my beliefs are the only beliefs that matter, and everyone else should have to deal with those and believe in the same way. As you can imagine, it is not very conducive to good communication. Cultural imposition is taking that one step further where it's enforcing my values onto someone else. So, something like um, Jehovah's Witnesses. They don't accept blood transfusions. Occasionally, even when they desperately need a blood transfusion. Part of their religion. If I was trying to treat a patient like that that needed that blood transfusion, I'm like, seriously, you're not gonna, you're gonna die. Um, hello, McFly. I am not going to get a good answer back, right? So, it's, you know, sometimes you get, so I understand that, but I want you to also understand that that is going to have a very bad effect on your, your health. That bridges gaps a whole lot better than the, what are you, stupid kind of thing? Because, yeah, I believe the blood transfusions are great. That person may not. Body language is about 75% of, of communication is nonverbal. Most of that is body language. So be very, very careful with your stance and it, the, the way that you hold your body. Um, we talk a lot about a closed stance or an open stance. Um, so things like this, and I probably should be at the front of the room when I'm doing this, it's a visual thing. I'm a dummy. But, um, so things like having your arms crossed and um, being at a distance, that sends a very closed message, like, okay, um, I'm only going to want to talk to you the minimum amount. I want yes, no answers, things, things like that. Whereas being out open, now it's okay, no, hey, I, I want information. I want to engage you. Just simply by changing the way I'm holding my arms. Use that to your advantage. If you have a patient who's potentially hostile, that gets amped up even more. Because you know they're right on the verge of going off. We want to be very, we want to, we want to de-escalate that situation. So a big thing, stay calm. Don't fall into the trap of getting amped up with them. Um, try not to assume an aggressive posture unless you need to assume a defensive posture. Okay, and there's it's a fine line between them sometimes. Um, but you don't want to chest up and get right back in the, the person's face. Because that sends a, a message of, okay, well, hey, this is going down, right? So they're going to amp up. Uh, use eye contact um, in reaction to how they react to that eye contact. Um, some people, you can kind of be like, okay, we're going to focus on the eye contact. You're upset. You're, you're, you're engaging them. Some people, that seems like I'm staring you down. You have, kind of have to look at how they react to it and change accordingly. Um, speak calmly, confidently, and slowly. Okay, real calm. Okay, listen. We're going to have to get you to go to the hospital. This is going to happen. 
don't be, don't really give them the, the option. Okay? No, this is going to have to happen. Are they going to fight back? Absolutely. You have the benefit of time. I'm paid by the hour. Okay? We'll sit there and keep, keep talking about this, talking about this, talking about this. Um, most of the time, they're, they're going to wear down and be like, whatever. Or they're going to act up enough to where they get put in cuffs. Okay. Uh, and we'll talk more about that when we get to uh, the medical legal too. Um, don't threaten the patient. Um, and again, that's kind of a there's a, it's a fine line between this has got to happen and you're going to do this. That can be construed either way, so you have to, have to read off your patient. But um, things like, okay, buddy, if you don't shut up and get in the truck, I'm going to punch you in the face. That's a, that's a whole other thing, right? Um, so. Physical factors that play into the noise is sounds, lighting, distance, things in between you, anything that gets in the way. Cultural norms can be different. Um, that is really special, like eye contact. Some cultures find that very aggressive. Read your patients, read what they're giving you back. Uh, if they're if you're staring at them and they're starting to get really <coughs> agitated and chest up, well, maybe you need to change that. Verbal communication, and I know I'll go through this pretty fast, but I'm trying to kind of get as much of this done as we can before we leave tonight. Um, Open-ended questions are fantastic. They're your friends, to a point. An open-ended question, what that is, is something that there is not a small number of answers. So uh, if I said, Devon, are you having pain? How many answers are there possibly to that? Yes, no, maybe, and I don't know. Tell me how you're feeling. How many answers are to that? Really, right? So an open-ended question gives them the opportunity to give you information that they wouldn't necessarily give otherwise. You don't want to end up in a game of 20 questions where you're trying to, is it this, is it that? Because it makes things so much more difficult. Now, that scene being said, a closed-ended question can also be your friend. Because if I go up and say, tell me what's going on, and I, and the patient starts with, in 1942, I had a bursitis. Whoa, I don't need to know what happened in 1942. Okay. How about we focus on today? You know, that kind of thing. So sometimes, you know, especially if you're in a hurry, too, closed-ended questions may be more appropriate. Because if you need information, you need specific information very quickly. So use those questions to get the information that you are wanting. And everybody kind of get the difference between the two? Both the tools. Facilitation is finding ways to help your patient get the information out that, they, that you're wanting them to get. Basically, you're kind of guiding them to what information you're wanting. Things like, oh, well, okay, well, yeah, we really need to focus on today. Okay, you're narrowing things down for them. Silence. You cannot listen and speak at the same time. So if you ask a question, shut up for a second and let them answer. Because otherwise you're going to miss details because you're busy trying to formulate the next question. So silence is not a necessarily a bad thing. Reflection is where you're kind of turning it back on them. So it's kind of like, okay, so what you're telling me is blah, blah, blah. Empathy is putting yourself in another person's shoes. So it's like, okay, I, I, I think I kind of get that. So you're, you're, you're really upset by that, right? Or, okay, you're trying to put yourself in their emotional state. Clarification is just that. Okay, asking questions of, well, I, I got this funny feeling in my chest. So, well, well, what kind of funny feeling? You're trying to get further detail. Confrontation. This is one that's probably underused is where you're challenging them. Uh, so it's... Sometimes you just have to call bullcrap. You know, if the patient's trying to tell you that um, they had all their medications stolen. They stole all my meds, that's why I'm not taking them. Blah, 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 blah. Can you give me pain meds? That kind of thing. But you happen to notice that they've got three grand in cash on them. What do you think happened to their meds? 
Let's say they were on Norco. They sold them, absolutely. Sold them. That's what they're probably going to you know, yeah. come back with. Yeah. But it's kind of like, you know, I had a guy tell me once he broke a telephone pole off with a motorcycle and told me he was doing 45 miles an hour. I'm like, dude, I'm not stupid. There was a one in front of that number. You, know, you just have to call them out on it. Um, interpretation is you're kind of summing things up. It's kind of like, well, um, okay, so this is what I'm getting out of this. I guess that's kind of the way to um, so you're, you're kind of trying to make sure that what you're gathering is what they're really intending. Um, explanation is um, getting, making sure that what you're hearing, you're taking that and then explaining it into the next step. So, um, okay, so you're telling me this. Okay, I understand that. So then um, that means that most likely we're going to have to do this. You're kind of doing this little bit of verbal tennis. Okay. In summary, finally, it's just that you're just kind of summing up. Like, okay, so what you're really telling me is short version of this. You know, long story short, this. All of them make sense? All right. Use them all. They're all great tools. Um, when you're interviewing a patient, touch is not always a bad thing. Key to it is knee and shoulder. <coughs> Don't go any closer to knee and shoulder unless you're invited in. Okay. Because um, if you think about it, any one of you, if I came up and touched you somewhere in between, you, you're going to be like, whoa, dude, back off, right? Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> you're going to take it one step further, yeah. So um, use touch appropriately. It can be very beneficial to you. Hand on a shoulder can fix a lot of stuff. Okay? Um, hand any closer in there can cause a lot of problems. Some things that can send you astray. False assurance that it's going to be okay. Or, um, I've done this hundreds of times when you've only done it once. Or you've never done it at all. That's one of those where you divert the question and just do what you need to do. Um, unsolicited advice. Oh, okay, so you're having some, some pain. I'll tell you what, why don't you just take some Tylenol and call us back. A headache will go away. Do you have all the information you need to know that that headache is just a headache or is it a hemorrhagic stroke? You don't know. Okay. So that's advice that you're not able to really give. Um, unsolicited advice also comes into that. You need to clean up your life. We have people that do that. It's like they start playing Dr. Phil. It's, whoa, you're not a counselor. Back off. You know, that kind of thing. Um, leading or biased questions. So... You're not really having chest pain, right? Okay. Well, no, I guess not. <laughs> they may very well be. Um, you'll see those used sometimes for to kind of talk people out of things because it's kind of a little way of calling bullcrap. Um, so there are times where that rule gets bent a little bit, but use a lot of caution with that. This is the one that probably trips most people up when they're new is talking too much. It's okay to just sit there for a second. Collect your thoughts and then say what you want to say. Um, that kind of leads into interrupting. They did a study. Um, most physicians will interrupt their patient within the first 18 seconds, or 15 or 18 seconds, or something like that, of meeting them. And then they wonder why they don't get the whole story. Because they're so busy about coming in, getting three pieces of information, and moving on to the next patient. Hold on for a second. Let them finish their thought. There are times where you're going to have to interrupt them because they'll just keep talking and talking and talking. And talking. So then sometimes you have to break the thing a bit. Um, why is a very dangerous word. Why on earth did you call an ambulance? Okay, well, that's not your thing to figure out. Um, what is usually a better term than what made you call an ambulance? Or, or you know, what changed to make you think you know, that kind of thing? Um, authoritative language. Never promise something that you're not willing to deliver on. You don't stop that. I'm going to speak. I had better be ready to sedate him. He's speaking better. Yeah. The one that the one that gets people the most often is listen. We can do this the hard way or the easy way. 
But guess which way they're going to choose? They're going to choose the hard way. And if you haven't talked to your cop yet, he may say, you have nothing illegal. So now you're in a pickle. Because there's no way you can take them. That kind of thing. So um, be very cautious with that. Don't, for those that have watched Top Gun, don't write checks that your butt can't cash. That kind of thing. Um, speaking in professional jargon. <laughs> you have no idea what I just said right here, right? What I was asking is your heart rate really fast and you feel like you're pounding. It's a whole lot easier just asking you feel like you're heart pounding. Right? So be careful with that professional guard. Um, you know, especially things like um, little kid, I'm going to take your blood pressure. I'm going to keep some. He asked me to get it back. <laughs> I'm like, uh. <laughs> I think I said something like, I'll trade you for a teddy bear or something. I mean, I believe it was, yeah. So, okay, things get just basically, what's that? Where are you going to take it? Yeah, yeah. Are you going to give it back? Um, so, friends, family, and bystanders, the biggest thing is remember that they need to be involved in all of this. And so, long story short here, um, involve them as much as you can, unless they start becoming a distraction or be causing a, a comic problem, and then don't be shy about, hey, we got to clear the room. That also applies to other responders. Um, there are times where it's, um, you know, let's say we're all on a run here, and it's a 14-year-old girl that needs a 12 lead. Do we really need to do a 12 lead with six guys in the room? It only takes two of us, right? Okay, so it's going to be me and Paul are going to do take guys down here to step out for a second. If you do it professionally, nobody's going to have a problem. Uh, some golden rules, use eye contact appropriately. I really don't like how they state that. You don't want to keep contact at all times, but make, use it appropriately. Use your name, use their name, their proper name. Start with formal, work your way towards non-formal. Okay? So it's, hi, Mr. Shaw, first. In three minutes, I might be calling you Pookie Bear. But you know what? That's your name from here on out. You're Pookie Bear. So... <laughs> But start formally. This is especially important with old people. We like to call them sweetie and and um, honey, things like that. Um, it comes across very patronizing. Um, slowly, clearly, distinctly. Make sure that they may not be able to hear you very well, so make sure that you're facing the patient. So that if they can read lips, they can do so. Um, if they have problems with hearing, it's okay to ask if one side's better than the other. And if so, stay on that side. Allow them time to respond. This is especially important when you have multiple people asking questions. I normally hate any time where there's more than one person asking questions. Um, I really think that one person should be doing the assessment. Um, so old people, that's kind of, we just talked about that, is um, give them time to respond, make sure that they're hearing you, understanding you. Don't assume that they're senile or confused or deaf. Um, if they get angry, diffuse it a little bit. You have time to, to work through it. It may be a little bit. There may be something brewing underneath there that you don't know about. Uh, they may be getting treated really poorly at the nursing home or something. Um, kind of watch them and get feed off of what they're giving you back as far as they keep turning their head and one ear towards you. It's probably because that's their good ear. Use that to your advantage. Then just be patient with them. Okay? It's going to take a little bit longer to get through that assessment with them than it was on someone who uh, is able to answer things faster. Keep in mind that older patients may not feel as much pain as younger patients. The, the nervous system degrades as they age. They also under-report a lot of time because of fears of going to the nursing home or never getting out of the hospital, things like that. Um, so you have to kind of read their face see whether their pain is a little worse than what they're going to be. Um, they may not be fully aware of changes with their body systems, also their uh, their living situation. Uh, so they may not realize that just because you get taken to a hospital doesn't necessarily mean that you have to go to the nursing home. Okay. So be really vigilant for those changes. So 
We have officially ran out of time, so we're going to finish this up next time. Uh, and then we're going to push on into the rest of the stuff we have planned for that night. So um, as far as your reading and your chapter, be prepared for that. Uh, we're...